Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council Committee Youth Services um, hearing. Okay, sergeants, are we ready with the recordings? PC recording all set. Recording to the clouds all set. Backup recording is on. Perfect. Okay, Dane, with your opening. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, good morning and welcome to the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? I repeat, at this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please, please, all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Rose, we're ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant of Arms. I want to thank you all for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important issue, SYEP. I am going to read my opening statement um, before I introduce the council members that have joined us. Good morning. My name is Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Youth Services. Today, the Committee on Youth Services is conducting an oversight hearing on the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development Summer Youth Employment Program. The committee will also hear resolution number 1388-2020, sponsored by Council Member Barron, which is calling on Congress to pass and the president to sign the All Dependent Children Count Act, HR 6420, and the All Dependents Count Act, S3652. These bills would extend the 2020 recovery rebates of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act to qualifying children over the age of 16. I'd like to now recognize the council members that have joined us for this hearing this morning. Uh, we are joined by Council Member Lewis, Council Member Chin, and Council Member Riley. Thank you colleagues for joining us. At today's hearing, the Committee on Youth Services will examine how the Adapted Summer Youth Employment Program or the Summer Bridge 2020 Program performed, as well as solicit provider feedback about the challenges of instituting remote and in-person services during the COVID-19 outbreak. The hearing will also seek to understand how services can be improved in the event COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic persists into the next program year and to hear from our participants about their experiences. Even before the COVID outbreak, the Summer Youth Employment Program has been an important connection for thousands of young New Yorkers to value, providing valuable internships, employment and educational opportunities thereby promoting individual development and socioeconomic upward mobility and serving as a way to address racial and economic disparities by bolstering life chance changes and chances and opportunities for disadvantaged youth. Crucially, this program has also been a source of much needed income for youth and their families, easing the economic burden and imparting a sense of self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-efficacy for participating youth. These benefits are even more important to thousands of disconnected youth in New York City, for whom the Summer Employ Youth Employment Program represents a critical link to education, work, and civic engagement, a way to productively occupy their time and to channel their energies into healthy growth promoting pursuits. The COVID-19 outbreak and the pivot to remote activities in so many areas of their life, which amplified the value of and the need for summer youth employment programs. As evidenced by the volume of applications for the remote version of this program, Summer Bridge 2020. 
the number of applications for this program far outpaced the number of available slots. Now more than ever, the Summer Youth Employment Program is needed as a structured, organized influence for young New Yorkers whose lives have been thrown into disarray by the pandemic. It is needed to give youth a much needed sense of predictability, some degree of control, purpose and direction, especially in the case of out of work, out of school, New York City youth. SYEP also serves to reduce social isolation, address learning loss, and to support healthy development and growth as productive individuals and engaged members of their communities. SYP, well, SYEP is absolutely a necessary source of income for youth and their families during these most trying times. For example, 91% of the Summer Bridge 2020 programs participants were from communities hardest hit by the COVID-19 outbreak. Their income would not only help the youth and their families, but would also promote local and national economic recovery in the form of consumer spending. The Summer Youth Employment Program is also so valuable and so important to so many New Yorkers that the goal should be not only full restoration of the program to its pre-COVID size, but the expansion of the program. The need is that great. Given that the pivot to remote, the remote version of Summer Youth Employment Program, Summer Bridge 2020, was developed in record time and during a national crisis, this was a monumental task. And as anticipated, there were issues and challenges surrounding the program. We are here today to examine the rollout of the Summer Bridge 2020 program, the, prob the problems that arose the responses to them, and the encouraging successes. We are here today to hear the concerns of youth, parents, providers, advocates, and community members, as well as to hear from the administration. We are here today to work cooperatively to ensure that our youth educational and social, socio-emotional needs are met and our communities are assisted in weathering this collective crisis and recovering from it. I would, like, I would really like to acknowledge the hard work, the advocacy and the collaboration that went into preserving, albeit in a drastically scaled down form, the Summer Youth Employment Program and launching its remote version this summer. I have to thank our providers, our advocates, and our young people for being able to adapt to these changes so swiftly. I wanna thank all of the staff who are working behind the scenes to make this hearing run smoothly, despite the chair's technological disparities. I'd like to thank the youth committee staff for their work on this issue. Committee policy analyst, Anastasia, Zemina, financial analyst Michelle Peregrine, and um, Elizabeth Arts, who is our speaker representative. I want to give a big thank you to my staff as well, Chief of Staff Christine Johnson, my Legislative Director Issa Cortez, and my Policy and Budget Aide Venori Ranawera. And with that, um, I'd like to give Council Member Barron. Um, if she's on, um, if she's arrived, uh, a moment for her remarks about Resolution 1388. Is Council Member uh, Barron here? Yes. Good morning, Council Member. Good morning, and thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank the chair for giving me these few minutes to just talk about what the resolution uh, is aimed to do. Uh, this is a very important hearing we're talking about. This committee is very important because we're talking about youth. We're talking about youth services and making sure that we do our part to uh, 
support them and advocate for them and make sure that the resources that they need are in fact entered into that budget. So I support the chair and uh, as all of the council members have fought in the past to make sure that the restorations are there, we're gonna have to fight even harder to make sure that we recognize that we are in the midst of a pandemic and we've got to work even harder to make sure that we can help restore students and programs that are beneficial in these very pressing economic times. I just want to thank the chair for allowing me to talk. The resolution is called the All Dependent Children Count Act and it's support of HR 6420. And what it will do is expand the 2020 recovery rebates. As you know, rebates were issued, but there was a cap and it was capped at 16 six children who were aged 16 and under. So what we want to do is to extend that so that qualified children over the age of 16 will be able to have these benefits given to their families as well. And it will include children younger than 19. And we understand that 19 is just a very arbitrary number, but particularly as students engage in uh, education, that students who are 24 and younger they would also be granted the benefits of the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, which we call the CARES Act. Uh, I won't take much more time than that, but I do wanna acknowledge and thank several people. First, of course, the chair, Debbie Rose, for this committee uh, hearing and for allowing me to speak. To our speaker, Corey Johnson, to the deputy director of Legislat legislative division and HR, Andrea Vasquez, the Assistant Deputy Director Smitha Desma and uh, Z Emmanuel Halu, uh, the Assistant, no, the Legal Policy Analyst Anastasia Zimini, and my Chief of Staff Joy Simmons, as well as my Legislative Director M. Indigo Washington. And with that, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and look forward to the remarks that the panels are going to bring forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Council Member Barron. Um, I really appreciate uh, you pushing this very important legislation. I, um, I will now turn uh, this over to my committee policy analyst who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing. Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, I am Anastasia Zimina, Legislative Policy Analyst for the Committee on Youth Services of New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call, you, I call on you to testify. After your call, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council members' questions will be limited to five minutes, and council members, please note that this includes both the question and the witness's response. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. This will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your question and the witness's answer. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function on Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Daphne Montanis, DYCD Assistant Commissioner for Youth Workforce Development, and Julia Brightman, Senior Director of Youth Workforce Development. I will deliver the oath to both of you, and after reading the oath, I will call upon each of you individually by name to respond to the oath one at a time. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Assistant Commissioner Daphne Montanis. Yes. Thank you. 
Senior Director, Youth Workforce Development, Julia Brightman. Yes. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Montanas, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Good morning, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee. I'm Daphne Montanez, Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Development at the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined today by Julia Brightman, Senior Director for Youth Workforce Development. On behalf of Commissioner Chong, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss Summer Bridge, DYCD's flagship youth workforce development program in 2020. Last spring, along with our nonprofit partners, we were deeply involved with the preparation for the Summer Youth Employment Program when the coronavirus pandemic interrupted. It soon became clear that health and safety considerations would not allow for the traditional SYEP program in which youth were placed in work sites throughout the city. With your partnership and in close coordination with our providers, we developed SYEP Summer Bridge an engaging virtual program that offered young people opportunities to learn new skills, explore potential careers, and earn money. All program activities, including enrollment, document verification, orientation, and work theme learning experiences took place safely and remotely, while still allowing for personal and group connections. The Summer Bridge program included 35,198 participants and 57 nonprofit provider organizations. In accordance with the equity principles of this administration, we prioritized enrollment for youth from communities most in need. 91% of participants lived in areas identified by the Racial Inclusion and Equity Task Force as priority neighborhoods based on health, social, and economic indicators including the locations hardest hit by the COVID pandemic. The program was funded at $51 million. The Summer Bridge program offered specialized options that mirrored the traditional SYEP program, community-based slots that were offered by lottery, the Career Ready program in partnership with select public schools, and SYEP special initiatives that serve vulnerable youth and residents of NYCHA developments. SYP Summer Bridge gave youth a unique opportunity to explore their interests and discover new ones. Career exploration allowed them to flex their research skills and discover new career possibilities. Skill building activities offered help with resumes, cover letters, and interview skills. And connections to professionals offered youth the opportunity to build their networks through mentoring, career panels, social media workshops, and more. Youth aged 14 and 15 received a stipend of $700 for 60 hours of participation, and those aged 16 through 24 received $1,000 for 90 hours. The SYEP Summer Bridge experience included three major components, the Hats and Ladders online program, project-based learning, and the Workplace Challenge learning opportunity for youth ages 16 and up. Hats and Ladders delivers career exploration and education through an engaging digital platform that allowed youth to complete a remote work readiness experience. The Hats and Ladders app is accessible via any internet connected mobile device or the web. Participants completed up to 30 hours of work readiness and educational activities. The course consisted of a participant self-assessment and four to eight topics or instructional sequences on topics mm -hmm. such as resume writing, financial. Summer Bridge offered virtual project-based learning experiences to both younger youth and older youth participants. In partnership with the Youth Development Institute, DYCD developed a digital learning portfolio centered on building civic engagement and career ready resources. The project-based activities help cultivate an ethic of service and reinforce core competencies, such as interpersonal, communication, and decision-making skills. Popular project-based learning themes included COVID-19, where youth developed an informational video on the disproportional effects on communities of color. Organizing for change, participants learned how organizing is used as a tool for local, civic, and democratic change. Environmental justice, youth explore their own personal impact on the environment and how to live sustainably. 
and cyberbullying. Participants in Staten Island, who are part of the United Activities Unlimited program, produced a podcast on cyberbullying and interviewed a psychiatrist about the long-term effects on children. In developing Summerbridge, DYCD worked with the Workforce Development Organization Grant Associates to create the Workplace Challenge Learning Opportunity, which allowed for New York City youth to gain exposure to industries and careers while simultaneously building workplace skills in a virtual environment. A workplace challenge is a career preparation activity in which small groups of young people are engaged in solving a real world problem or a challenge issued by an industry partner. We partnered with more than 1000 organizations including prominent corporations such as Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, Google, Morgan Stanley, SoundCloud, Vox Media and Warby Parker for the Workplace Challenge. The SYEP Summer Bridge model included specialized options in addition to the community slots. In 2020, the Career Ready Program served 3,981 participants through 60 school partnerships. The Career Ready SYEP program was created to provide enhanced opportunities for youth attending select public high schools to explore career options and develop work readiness skills. Though this model features some universal elements, it is uniquely shaped and customized by each school and SYEP provider partnership. The Map to Success option for NYCHA residents served 2,003 participants. In July of 2014, the de Blasio administration launched the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, or MAP, to reduce violence and make neighborhoods safer in and around 15 New York City Housing Authority developments that have some of the highest crime rates in New York City. Providers work collaboratively with NYCHA Developments, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and MAP partner agencies to recruit and enroll program participants. Career First NYCHA was designed to expand access to career readiness, as well as summer youth employment opportunities for youth residing in additional NYCHA public housing complexes. In 2020, it served 865 youth in nine developments. Providers work collaboratively with NYCHA developments and community-based partners to recruit and enroll program participants. Finally, the Emerging Leaders option was designed to provide SYEP opportunities to vulnerable youth who meet at least one of the following barriers, homeless or runaway youth, justice involved youth, youth in or aging out of foster care, and youth in families who are receiving preventative services through New York City's Administration for Children's Services. This option served 1,919 youth in 2020 with priority given to the highest needs youth. At the end of the program, we asked our participants about their experience. We were pleased that 92% agreed the program provided them with an opportunity to learn a new skill and it opened up new career options for them. We would like to share an example of the feedback we received from one of our participants. Winter shared a testimonial about her experience. She told us, quote, this year is definitely a year like no other. I have been faced with one of the most difficult times in my entire life. My family was sick with COVID-19. The most difficult task was having to take care of an entire household. I was left in devastation by the loss of two loved ones. I needed an outlet and a break. I was notified that I was able to be a part of SYEP Summer Bridge. Although it was challenging because I had to discipline myself to do the work virtually, I am so grateful I did it. This Summer Bridge experience has given me knowledge and the skills necessary to be successful as I prepare for college and beyond." End quote. This past year has been challenging, but our commitment to offering positive experiences to young people remains strong. We are especially grateful to the City Council for your advocacy and support of SYEP and Youth Workforce Development programs. I am now happy to answer your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we've been joined by Council Members Perkins and Council Member Eugene. Um, and uh, I, again, I'd like to thank the administration for your testimony. Um, last year, uh, 
as we all know, after the mayor announced plans to totally eliminate SYP, uh, did you continue to contingency plan given that, you know, advocacy um, was, yeah, was very vocal um, and that we were with the hope that the decision was going to be reversed? And if you did, how at all did you include the provider or if at all, did you include the provider community in those conversations? And as you prepare for summer 2021, how have you or how are you planning to engage the providers in those planning conversations? Yes, uh, right after the announcement was made, once it was clear that uh, from a health and safety uh, perspective, that the traditional SYEP could not be operated safely for our participants, uh, we began uh, starting to plan around an alternate program um, that would be virtual. And in all of our planning, we started to include uh, leaders in the field and reaching out to our provider partners to gain their input as well as we develop the plan. Um, and we developed technical assistance to help assist providers because we knew uh, both the short period of time to get a new pr program up and running would be a challenge and also operating a program and connecting with young people in a virtual manner would be new for all of us and uh, our providers would need that level of support. So uh, as with all of our programs, uh, whether in person or with this past summer, we uh, do engage very closely with our providers and gaining their input and uh, looking forward to this coming summer, we are currently planning for uh, the SYP 2021 uh, program. Uh, those plans are underway. We will be working closely with our providers as we build out those plans. Um, but it must be said also that there are a great deal of uncertainties that lie ahead of us at this stage, both in terms of health and safety conditions on the ground and uh, availability of work sites and placements uh, for young people. So we will be uh, working very closely with our providers in terms of their own capacity, what their thoughts are on what a uh, program would look like uh, as we head into the summer and we have more clarity around what uh, the conditions will look like uh, going forward. So are you planning to uh, continue, um, is, your contingent, is your plan to continue to um, deliver services remotely? And, um, and if so, um, are you talking to the providers now about capacity um, and giving them some realistic uh, direction and, and guidance and, and uh, realistic numbers maybe uh, so that they can talk about the capacity that they're looking to, you're looking to have them uh, achieve? Yes, so uh, what we are going to be doing is planning for every potential possibility uh, that could present itself. We will be prepared to uh, run a program uh, similar to uh, the program in 2019, should conditions allow and worksite availability be possible to be done in person. However, as of today, as we know where we are with the uh, corona pandemic, um, that is quite uncertain. Uh, I don't think anyone knows uh, exactly what conditions will look like on the ground, uh, what work sites will be open and uh, able to take on large numbers of youth. And so I think our experience from this past summer with SummerBridge, we have learned quite a great deal about running a remote program. Uh, there are some elements and best practices that we can leverage, we could incorporate, that we hope to incorporate into the program, uh, allowing for even a hybrid program where there would be some in-person elements as well as some remote elements. And our planning will definitely uh, involve our provider partners in having those discussions. Uh, many of the great uh, ideas around some of the project-based learning themes and how to engage young people really came from our providers. And so we really re will rely on them and work very closely with them as we start planning uh, for this coming summer. 
And what is your timeline in terms of involving them in the discussions for the planning? So we typically begin our uh, planning and have a large provider meeting uh, in January. So forthcoming, we'll be holding uh, a larger meeting to begin discussions, and then we'll be holding individual conversations with our providers shortly thereafter. Okay, um, I just want to I want to stress how important communication is, and you know, and that everyone's getting the same information uh, in real time. Uh, so that we can achieve, you know, our goals to get to where we need to be. Uh, and given the late timing of the fiscal 2021 adopted budget on June 30th of 2020, when did the SYEP bridge program begin and when did the program conclude? So uh, once the, uh, the budget was adopted uh, on July 1st, we notified all of our SYAP providers, uh, sent out surveys to uh, confirm their participation in the program, confirm their uh, capacity uh, for the summer. We held our first uh, provider kickoff meeting on July 6th, and uh, the launch of the application took place on July 9th and was open until July 15th. And uh, the lottery and enrollment process began on the 16th and ran for two weeks. Uh, um, the shortest and most compressed time to get things up and running for the first day of the program on July 27th. And uh, the last day of the program was on August 28th. Okay. I just wanna add that um, this, this program would not have been possible if we had not been in constant communication with our provider community. Um, as, you, as Daphne mentioned, you know, the moment that the traditional program, we realized the traditional program would not be able to take place over the summer, we started a feedback loop with our providers, constantly soliciting their feedback, trying to understand what's going on on the ground in their communities, the needs of their young people, their, their partners, their worksite partners, what's available, what's possible. And that, that's what allowed us to truly launch the program in, the tiny, in this tiny time span that we were allowed. Um, as Daphne mentioned, this was the most compressed timeline. Uh, truly, as soon as the budget passed, that very same morning, our providers received an email uh, requesting their allocation, but they knew that email was coming because we were in constant communication, letting them know that as soon as the budget passes, this, this is the model that we're going forward with. And the model truly was the result of provider feedback. Um, and that is why they were able to launch so quickly because this is what they knew they, their organizations wanted to uh, put together for their young people. This is what their young people requested. And I think it speaks to the level of engagement that we had from our young people, that this model truly spoke to their needs this summer. We, on, the, on July 1st, we sent out that email uh, asking our providers to return their uh, slot allocation, their capacity surveys, and we had them the following day. And that, that's truly when the program launched. Okay, thank you. Um... During uh, the summer, uh, the yeah, SYAP Bridge uh, annual report summary said that 2008 devices were distributed to participants. Could you tell me who provided these devices? What kind of devices were distributed? What was your total budget spent on these devices? And uh, were more devices needed than were provided? So I'll begin and I'll have Julia uh, give a little more detail, but one of the most important considerations as we were putting the uh, program together and developing the model was ensuring that all of our participants would have access and could participate fully in the Summer Bridge program. Uh, we worked very closely with our DOE partners to ensure that every young person who is a DOE student would be able to continue using their DOE issued device throughout the summer. And uh, that also included graduating seniors, allowing them the opportunity to continue using it for the purposes of Summer Bridge. And then additionally, we know that there are a number of young people who were not connected to uh, the Department of Education and would 
possibly need devices. And in order to ensure that we uh, covered every single uh, a participant, we purchased over 2,000 uh, devices that we distributed to the providers who then uh, distributed to their young people. And in particular, we were very intentional about ensuring that those most in need, particularly in, in, the, in the, uh, the NYCHA uh, options, had access to uh, obtaining a device. And Julia, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Our, you know, our original conversation started with our NYCHA partners um, when uh, members of that administration uh, expressed to us that they felt that about 50% of their household are either not connected to the internet, do not have a device or a Wi-Fi signal. And that's when we realized that in order to make this program feasible for the young people we're trying to reach, we needed technology had to be part of the equation. So we secured funding from our partners at YMI, as well as private funding that came through the mayor's fund uh, to purchase over 2000 devices. Uh, we had over 800 iPads and um, Samsung internet ready tablets. And those were distributed first to uh, organizations who were operating programs for our most in need youth, such as emerging leaders and young people residing in NYCHA households. And then we distributed to all of our providers who felt that their communities uh, would, would require technology. And we had a reserve at DYCD so that anytime anybody felt they needed an additional device, they could always come in and, and pick up a device. And these devices were internet connected for the next 12 months. So uh, organizations were able to continue to use those devices with their young people in programs. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, there was not a single young person in the program that was not able to participate because of technology. Uh, in fact, our providers were able to redistribute some devices that were not used for Summer Bridge to RHY um, homeless shelters. Um, yeah, that's commendable um, that you were able to provide devices for all of all of the um, the participants. Um, maybe you could have worked with DOE uh, so that they could have been able to help uh, meet that goal. Uh, as we still have young people that don't have devices, um, that's a very critical part of their educational. Um, their learning. Um, could you, um, were the young people able to keep these devices after, after the program ended or did you? Um, uh, if they continue to participate uh, in a program with their provider, we really left it to the provider's discretion. So if a young person needed them for another program that they continued into the fall, then we left it to the providers. Uh, to allow them to hold on to that device. How much did that cost? We spent, uh, it was nearly $800,000. And as I mentioned, a lot of it came from private funding and uh, from the Young Men's Initiative. And so um, because SYEP is a lottery, there's a chance that we'll get um, youngsters that didn't participate uh, last summer Will we be able to provide them with the dev with devices, and um, and to meet that, that would be the that would be the plan going forward. As I mentioned, a lot of our providers still have uh, a number of devices that were either returned or uh, they they ended up not needing to distribute. So that we already have some in stock. But absolutely, if we're if we're once again, unfortunately, in in one of these strange socially distant summers then the plan would be once again to replenish that technology supply. Did um, private and public com companies both engage in the planning? Um, and if so, how? And um, did they also, um, how many private organizations um, and public organizations participated in the programming? So yes, uh, we were pleased that so many from uh, so many companies and organizations from the private sector really stepped up to assist us and uh, really knew the importance of ensuring that uh, Summer Bridge program uh, was uh, supported. 
And uh, they did this in a variety of ways. We received uh, through the mayor's fund and their fundraising uh, over $6.6 .6 million in donations towards uh, the program. And additionally, uh, probably one of the most uh, exciting aspects of uh, this summer's program was something, uh, a new element uh, called the Workplace Challenge. And it was an opportunity for young people, although we could not offer an in-person work experience, uh, it was an opportunity for them to work closely with industry partners uh, in small groups, uh, working on a, a challenge or a, a business problem presented by a volunteer from uh, participating organizations. And we got wonderful feedback, both from the participants and from uh, the organizations that participated. We had a wonderful partnership with uh, Tech NYC, where uh, over 300 uh, companies, primarily in the technology space, which uh, traditionally has not been an SYEP uh, core industry group, uh, they signed up to uh, provide. Um, and we have uh, these workplace challenges. And so uh, we hope to continue the workplace challenge as we think about our plans for uh, 2020 is certainly a best practice. And we hope to continue our partnerships, uh, both the tech and NYC and the other uh, for-profit companies and private sector uh, industries that participated this summer. Can you tell me um, how many of the private sector uh, for-profit um, organizations, uh, businesses um, that, uh, that you engaged this past summer um, were uh, minority owned black and brown businesses? Uh, um, can you yes. give us a number? So um, actually uh, we, We are currently grow program, and as far as in terms of our internship development for Workland and Grow, we have partnered with SBS and the Mayor's Office on MWBEs, and they have 58 of these MWBEs have provided over 200 internship opportunities to our young people. Uh, this is uh, probably one of the most uh, exciting elements uh, in terms of our employer engagement uh, for our workforce development programs for this, for work, learn and grow. Uh, many of these internships are uh, being offered remotely, which is a, a new way of delivering internships and also being responsive to have such a strong start to the MWBE um, part, uh, partnership. And it is our hope to continue that partnership and expand it into the summer. Did you utilize any of them for the Summer Bridges program? We can uh, verify through, we'd, ha we'd have to get back to you on a particular MWBE uh, partnerships. Um, but for the most part, the real intent Intentional campaigns uh, began this fall with uh, the Work, Learn, and Grow program. Um, could you tell me what the per, per participant um, price was for the Summer Bridge program? I'm sorry, I, I did not hear that question, sorry. Um, what is the per participant price that um, was paid per for the participant this summer? What was the per participant price? Yes. For a summer bridge Six, program. I'm sorry, S sorry, my internet, um, $600 per participant. Okay, and um, uh, you had a budget of $51 million. Um, how much was spent on total stipends that were paid out? And um, how much of that went to younger youth? 
um, for stipends and uh, to older youth for stipends. Yes, the total is one hundred and forty dollars, and for older youth, uh, nineteen million five hundred forty-seven thousand three hundred twenty-two dollars and fifty cents, and for younger youth, five million eighty-eight thousand eight hundred seventeen dollars and fifty cents was paid out. And uh, for um, for the older youth, it was nineteen what? Nineteen. I'm sorry. Nineteen million five hundred forty-seven thousand. Three hundred and twenty-two dollars and fifty cents. Okay. How long did, um, on the average, how long did it take before the participants received their stipends? So stipends were paid on a weekly basis to uh, young people. And um, give me one second. I believe the very first first payroll for participants was on August uh, the first. Julia can correct me if I'm. wrong but i will august and august 1st and they start and they started july uh 15th you said july 28th 7th and july july 20 yes and the first pay date was august 7th excuse me okay all right um i'm i'm going to uh yield um my time and come back for a second round but uh, i'd like to give my um my colleagues the opportunity to ask questions. Um, uh, Anastasia, do we have um, any questions? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I will now call on council members in the order in which they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, which includes time for the witness's response. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. We will now hear questions from Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Riley. Um, Council Member Barron, please, you may begin. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the getting the information as to uh, how the money actually was distributed and how it was used. But before I get to that, what is the total, when did the application period begin for students who wanted, for children who wanted to be a part of the summer youth program, Summer Bridges? What was the start date for the applications? Launching, the application was launched on July 9th and it was open until July 15th. Yes. The 9th through the 15th, okay. How many applications did you receive? We received 137,000 applications. And how many spots were finally uh, awarded, were filled? 35,198. What percentage is that? I don't have my calculator in front of me. It's got to be like one, um, one. Do some quick math. <laughs> uh, okay, found my calculator. About 25%. That's what I thought, about 25%. Um, and I heard you say that the providers, your partners did in fact distribute um, devices so that students, so that children would be able to fulfill their responsibilities and get the full objective of learning how to be in the workplace. I contend that there were many, many more than 137,000 children who would have applied, but did not in fact, between that period of July 9th and 15th, have a device. They weren't able to go to uh, the library or to other locations to use a device. 
And I, I would submit that that number of 137,000 is not a true reflection of the number of children who would like to have gotten a consideration to work in the summer. We know that particularly children living in uh, economically oppressed communities have very low opportunity to have a bandwidth that would allow them to participate. We know that NYCHA developments have very poor reception. So the first thing I wanna make, first point is that I would contend that there are many, many more than 137,000 children who would have applied. We're glad to know that the providers did get the devices to them. What would happen? Who had the responsibility of addressing concerns of malfunctioning devices? So are we, I'm sorry, I'll start and Julia, you can jump in. Absolutely. Um, Throughout the process, uh, not only before the start of Summer Bridge, but throughout the summer, uh, we were in very close uh, contact with our providers and made it known that should any of their participants have any issues with their devices, either the devices that we had distributed or those through the DOE, that we would work with our DOE partners and our, uh, our own internal uh, information technology okay. unit to help support and uh, troubleshoot any, any issues. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I hope that the students, the children who were participants, I hope that their testimony uh, embraces that and supports that as well. And if it doesn't, I would think that there have been some gaps someplace, some cracks and we need to address that. And just my, finally, uh, what were the zip codes from which the participants came? I heard you say you focused on those communities that were most devastated by the coronavirus. And what zip codes was that? So we can provide you with uh, that detail. I would be happy to follow up with that level of detail. But uh, as mentioned in uh, the testimony, uh, we really wanted to focus on those areas that are highlighted by the Racial and Equity Task Force um, mm -hmm. and included uh, those areas that were most uh, hit hardest by the COVID pandemic this spring. And uh, you'll find uh, that they very closely parallel. Those two categories yes. are very closely Absolutely. parallel. So I would love for the chair to be able to receive that information and not just the zip codes, but the number of participants from each of the zip codes. Um, I'm particularly interested in my zip codes, which were 11207, 08, 11212, 11239 also, uh, because particularly 11239 had the highest mortality rate in the city. So I want to make sure that uh, there's a representation of that. And I would also like to have that information as to the applicants' zip codes. I'd like to see how those zip codes matched up with students who actually were selected. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Anya, who's next? Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we will now hear from Council Member Chin followed by Council Member Riley. Council Member Chin, please proceed. Time starts okay. now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Rose, uh, for holding this important hearing. And, um, you know, the whole issue with fighting for uh, the summer youth program is dear to all our hearts. And uh, we're very glad that we were able to have, you know, some kind of uh, program that started the summer, uh, and I'm looking at the number, we were only able to provide 25% uh, uh, of the, um, the slots from uh, all the kids that apply. So I wanted to hear from you, Assistant Commissioner, uh, do you have any idea from provider uh, now what their capacity could be? Could they do more than just uh, 25%, because I think every year, um, the number of applicants has been around, you know, over 100,000. Uh, so I think the first thing is that, um, do we know if providers, you know, can increase the number and how you are gonna sort of help with that? 
And the other thing is that we will be fighting for more funding because 35,000 is not enough. I mean, I think last, um, in 2019, maybe you can tell us how many uh, summer youth uh, job was provided uh, compared to 2020. And so that we can uh, see what, you know, what the difference was. Absolutely. Well, firstly, I have to thank uh, the, the council for their uh, continued and ongoing support of SYEP and uh, for your advocacy. Um, it is uh, greatly appreciated and it is always our goal to serve as many young people as possible. Looking forward to this coming summer, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we are in the beginning stages of planning for this coming summer. And part of that uh, planning process will include conversations with our uh, providers, uh, not only with regards to their capacity, but also in terms of the program model and what it could look like given the uncertainty that we're heading into uh, for uh, the spring from a health and safety perspective, as well as uh, worksite availability. Uh, we know that there's a lot of uncertainty. We're not clear on uh, if it will be safe for in-person uh, in interns if we'll have to provide a bit of a hybrid of remote and in, uh, in person uh, internships as well. So more to come. And, you know, we want to ensure that we are planning for every possibility and uh, be as flexible as we can to allow the providers to serve as many young people as effectively as possible. Um, I believe you also asked a question regarding uh, our service levels for 2019. Uh, last year, we enrolled 74,453 participants in SYEP. So we are only we only did pretty much half this past summer. So I think that we, you know, we've been fighting for universal SYEP, that every youth who applies should be able to. Um, to participate. So we're gonna to continue to fight for more funding. And I think it's really important for you to work with the providers and really target, you know, the increased number. Because, you know, a lot of kids, you know, right now are doing virtual uh, learning. So equipments are available and hopefully they will have a wonderful experience during the summer. Um, and, and that's what we wanted to push for. And in this budget process, I'm sure Chair Rose, myself, another council member, are not gonna just stop at not fighting for more funding. I mean, last year we had to fought hard to, to put it back, but 51 million is not definitely not enough. And we wanted to at least get back to the level of 2019, if not, you know, continue to add more because so many kids can benefit. Uh, from this program. And uh, the, la my last question is that, uh, do we know how many kids who, were, who are in the homeless uh, shelter were able to participate um, in the summer youth program? Were they one of the target population? Yes, uh, and before I, I give you that number, I just also want to add that the, uh, there are no reductions taken from uh, the preliminary FY22 budget for SYEP. So we do, do remain stable currently at the full $132 million uh, budget. Expired. So I just wanted to uh, clarify that. Oh, wait, 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 <laughs> I, I wanna hear. Yeah, say that so again. In, yeah, say that again. Please. So in the preliminary budget, it's already 132 million allocated? Yes, for uh, the FY22 uh, program for SYEP. SYEP program. Yes. Now, the final budget uh, will depend, obviously, on a number of factors, including what the program model will look like, uh, provider capacity, so more work to be done there. Uh, but uh, we are looking at uh, the $132 million uh, uh, stable level for funding for FY22 in the preliminary plan. But we have to make sure it didn't get eliminated like last year. <laughs> it's budget. Well we, well, we had to like start from zero and we finally were able to get 
at least 51 restore. But it's good to hear. Good. See, Chair Rose, you, you know, yes. you, you can thank the mayor on Thursday. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. But um, is that inclusive of um, just SYEP or is that including um, summer camps yeah. and um, work, learn, grow? What, what is that? What is that inclusive of? That is the SYEP budget. Yes, the SYEP wow. budget. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to fight for that. Believe me, and um, and maybe even more. Um, thank the summer you. and the other summer programs. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh um, yeah. You have the statistic in terms of the homeless uh, children in uh, homeless shelters. Were they able to participate? Yes. We had 1,843 uh, homeless youth that applied and 873 were enrolled in the program. Oh, okay. Thank and you. I just wanted to add, um, Council Member Barron raised this question about how we went about recruiting young people that didn't have access to technology. Um, and, and I just wanted to reiterate that we ensured that young people that didn't have access to technology from before they could apply had access to the application. And so our providers that typically work with vulnerable groups, such as young people who are in homeless shelters and young people in NYCHA developments who don't have access to that technology, they recruited the way they would have recruited in a regular year following social distancing guidelines. But they did have paper applications and paper recruitment materials. And once they uh, once they were able to collect applications and documents from those young people, they were then given the technology to be able to participate in the program. Great, thank you. Thank um, you, Chair. I, I just wanna um, uh, sort of circle back on uh, Council Member Barron's point um, uh, about, you know, that 91% of the participants were from communities that were impacted mostly by COVID-19 and um, and uh, we wanted to know which neighborhoods they were specifically. So we'll be looking forward to getting that information um, in terms of uh, the zip codes and the numbers that um, that participated in the program. And um, I, I really would like to see also um, uh, how, uh, if in fact, they were also offered programming um, in the Ladders to Leaders program, which is you know, a cohort of SYEP that um, is a nationally recognized program that offers um, 1,100 slots to top tier high school students. So I just wanted to uh, have included in, in that information, that data, if any of the um, 1,100 students were from zip codes of the uh, highest level, uh, having been impacted by the highest level of COVID-19. Yes, we actually we didn't have a separate Ladders for Leaders program last summer. Uh, our providers who typically would have run a Ladders for Leaders program had the option of operating a standard summer bridge model, which they did there was not a separate internship program. Um, and in terms of the 91%, we will definitely get you that information. Uh, but I just wanted to say that the, the reason that it's so high for those high need zip codes is that was intentional. We allocated our slots to those zip codes to ensure that the young people in those communities receive the services they need most. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think the next uh, speaker, I Council member? Yeah. Uh, if I may just take a moment to remind council members that if they would like to pose a question to use the raise hand Zoom fu function on Zoom. And also, um, after I call your name, please wait a moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may, may begin your testimony. Um, we will hear next from council member Riley, followed by council member Minchaka. Council member Riley. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Rose, for hosting this hearing. Uh, this is a very near and dear uh, committee to me. This is uh, my first hearing with you all today. Um, youth services is something that's very imperative, especially the Summer Youth Employment Program. And like stated earlier this um, earlier today and during the rally, um, like Chair Rose, uh, myself, 
Um, we came in through this program. This was like uh, uh, our first opportunity to work. So this is a very imperative program. Um, with that being said, um, my question is, I know there were a lot of virtual programming implemented, and I just want to know what was uh, the impact or the input of youth um, in the program that they wanted to do or utilize during the summer. Um, I know that the youth have been, you know, very, it's been very challenging being that they have been doing remote learning. Um, so I just want to know how much input did the youth have um, in the program that they wanted to utilize um, during this uh, SYEP summer bridge program. I, I noticed that my colleague Daphne is muted, so I'll I'll go ahead and, and start. Um, I, I just want to say that um, every every step of the program truly encompassed youth voice and youth choice. And we knew that in a summer when young people felt like so much was taken out of their control and so many decisions are being made for them by factors outside of everybody's control, that this program really did speak to their interests and to their needs. And so from the very beginning, young people would start on the digital platform Hats and Ladders that began with an assessment. And that was a very personal assessment where young people uh, put in their career choices and their interests. And based on that assessment, they would receive an individualized course study on that platform. So no two young people's uh, experience in the Hats and Ladders platform looked the same. Um, from that point on, they went on to project-based learning, where again, providers worked with their young people to design what their project-based learning experience would look like. Uh, we, we had a digital library of projects that young people and providers could choose from where they could design their own. And we could see that. And uh, our providers in the feedback we received that some groups really wanted to work on COVID recovery while other groups said they never want to hear the word COVID again. And we, young people participated in civic engagement and came up with their own projects for how to revitalize their communities and uh, drive up voter registration and census response. Uh, workplace challenge, young people had a choice of which companies to work with. And again, how to design that challenge, how to respond to the challenges posed to them. So truly this was uh, an experience that young people designed for themselves. And we saw that in their feedback, uh, you know, 90% of the young people responded that they loved the experience that they thought it prepared them for returning to school or to work. And they felt more comfortable using these Zoom and virtual technologies and felt uh, much more empowered after the experience. Thank you. Um, and my next question is kind of to piggyback on my colleague, council member um, Barron's question. Um, I know it was about seven days uh, that um, families had the opportunity to apply for the program. Um, but during those seven days, um, I also used to work for a foster agency and it's very challenging to get the paperwork together, um, especially if you don't have remote access. Um, is it possible to extend that time period to at least 10 days for families um, that I guess would run into that issue. And also, is there gonna be a more transparent layout for um, our immigrate, immigrant population of families who had issues the first time this program was rolled out and they weren't able to access the application or apply for the application? Yes, yeah, so as part of uh, the enrollment process this year, we recognized that uh, we had to make some uh, adjustments and allow for flexibility in terms of documentation, uh, given that we, are, we were in, in the middle of a pause, many government agencies were not open, and so we worked very closely with our providers to allow for some flexibility um, and allow for participants to follow up with some of the necessary documents. We wanted to to ensure that we did not uh, put up as uh, too many barriers to actually accessing uh, Summer Bridge. And so um, that is something that we will continue to look at uh, as we further develop the model for this coming summer, but certainly where we found ourselves uh, this summer with only two weeks to enroll young people in the time period where we found ourselves in time. Time expired. 
we we had to make those adjustments. And uh, well, if uh, we do continue to see that there are continued barriers to obtaining uh, enrollment materials, we will certainly uh, continue those flexible arrangements with providers and participants. And just to add um, for our vulnerable populations, such as young people in foster care, that deadline, the, the seven day open application period, that was only for the online application period for the lottery. So young people in specialized options had longer time to be recruited and submit their documentation. Thank you. I'll yield my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I would like to remind council members um, that if they would like to ask a second round of questions, uh, then please keep your questions to two minutes, which includes both your question and the response. Um, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Okay, um, there seems to be no um, questions for the second round. Um, so I will, uh, I will turn to Chair Rose for any closing remarks. Oh, my apologies, my apologies. I am seeing, um, my apologies. Council Member Minchaka would like to pose a question. Council Member Minchaka. Time starts now. Um, uh, thank I'm you. Sorry, uh, if you want count, I'm sorry, please uh, hold uh, Council Member's time. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, we have been joined by Majority Leader Cumbo. I'm sorry. Colleague, uh, start the clock again for him. Thank you. Time, time starts now. Thank you, Chair, uh, for your work and looking forward to fighting with you and all the council. Um, I have a question for the administration. Uh, you know, we learned so much from our battle last year. And I just want to acknowledge that I think that, that even you were all taken by surprise at DYCD about what happened and the kind of uh, slash and burn that we all felt that caused an incredible movement to rise. But let's learn from, from that and do something different. What, what, uh, what would be a positive, how could we, um, I'm trying to ask this question uh, without throwing so much shade, but I guess what I wanna say is the work that we are trying to do here is to set this up for success. And what we failed to do, even in our budget process, was give the organizations the opportunity to plan for the most, some of our most vulnerable community members, like our youth, and give them the time to plan so that they can have a successful summer. We gave them money so last minute at the end of June that they couldn't even get themselves going. And then they failed and that was on us. So what value can we do in seeing the mayor's of gonna release his preliminary budget tomorrow? What value can we see from your perspective in saying yes to SYP now so that they can prepare for the summer? Do you see value in that? Absolutely. Um, and this past uh, spring and summer, we really only had two months to uh, create and launch Summer Bridge with uh, provider input. Uh, even though there is still a great deal of uncertainty in terms of what the summer program will look like, the model will look like, uh, we now can begin and we have begun our planning process. And part of that planning process will include engaging providers later this month uh, to start asking them about uh, their thoughts on the program model, both from uh, planning for health and safety concerns for our young people, um, since there is still an open question as to where uh, the city will be as we head into spring and summer, as well as worksite availability as well. We know that uh, many of the industries that have typically provided placements in years past uh, have certainly uh, been uh, under tremendous stress and strain, and uh, we're not sure how many of those industries will be back and in what format they would be able to provide placements. So we have the benefit of actually beginning in January versus a two, two month span of time. Um, and as with all of our programming, particularly when we're working in a challenging environment in understanding what the needs on the ground will be, we will go to our provider uh, partners to help us develop 
uh, the plan. So uh, the model will definitely be informed by the providers, will have a better understanding of their capacity. And so uh, we know that in order to ensure successful programs that our partnership with our, part our provider partners is crucial. Okay, so I heard that you see the problem um, that working, working in advance is gonna be helpful. Will we see uh, SYP in this preliminary budget fully funded uh, at the levels that we need uh, to engage the youth that have been impacted, that are in, uh, incredibly impacted, not just by mental health, but uh, just by education in general? So there are no reductions uh, currently in the FY22 SYEP budget, and uh, the budget currently stands at $132 million. In terms of the final budget, uh, that will all depend on a number of factors, including what the final uh, program model will look like. Okay, um, I am, I'm almost uh, out of time, but I think this is gonna be, what, we, what we're talking about now is probably some of the most critical components of ensuring the success of this program, the, the universal program that we're gonna be fighting for. And we really wanna work with you and your agency to engage uh, in a way that, that sets us up for success. Uh, I think that we did a disservice to even the, the failed attempt uh, to, to, to inject money. Uh, I know the chair and I were having conversations after the budget about how many problems we saw. And that was just, that, that is beyond heartbreaking. This was, this was, this was set up to fail and that, will, that cannot happen again. And so I'm hoping that your intentions and the work that you're, that you're describing now really manifest into something, um, but time expired. that's the work that we have to do. So thank you so much chair for this time. Welcome. At this time, I've concluded this round of questions. So I will now turn to Chair Ross for any closing remarks before administration will be excused. No, Chair, Chair, Chair Rose uh, has some, some questions. <laughs> so um, we're not uh, closing yet, but um, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna echo um, how important uh, Council Member Menchaka's remarks are about the planning. And I was really glad to hear um, that you're going to begin the planning um, next month um, with the providers so that, uh, like there's no surprises that everybody knows what's happening, what, you know, what to anticipate. Uh, we just won't know what the numbers are. So um, if the plan is to stay remote again, will, um, will any of the features be changed or added? And, um, and if so, will additional cohorts be included like the Ladders for Leaders program? Will that be something that will be uh, considered for um, this, this round? Yes, uh, so beginning with your Ladders for Leaders question, we will be resuming Ladders for Leaders for this coming summer. Uh, the application will actually uh, be launched in a, a couple of weeks. We typically start recruitment for Ladders for Leaders uh, earlier in the year um, to allow for enough time for the more enhanced uh, work readiness uh, training and uh, as well as for early uh, placement for some of our uh, for-profit companies. Um, in terms of uh, lessons learned, we learned a great deal from this past summer uh, through SummerBridge, the elements that uh, were uh, most uh, helpful to young people in terms of their growth from a work readiness skills perspective, in terms of their ability to explore various careers uh, using the hats and ladders, uh, uh, online platform allowed for a uniform uh, way of delivering work readiness uh, training uh, and orientation. And I think we want to continue to use that. However, we also received a lot of feedback about additional topics that we could uh, include. So we'll be working with hats and ladders on making those adjustments project-based learning, uh, definitely including youth voice and having the connections to the providers uh, was definitely seen as uh, very vital to uh, encouraging engagement. 
And then uh, the workplace challenge, brand new to us, uh, but was really, uh, I think, a standout in terms of the model uh, this year as a way of ensuring that we continue uh, connections between employers and industry and our young people um, and having the ability for them to work together as peers on uh, projects and uh, in a fun way, developing their uh, work readiness skills, their decision-making skills, time management, presentation skills. So we see a lot of value in that. And regardless of what the model will look like, we certainly want to incorporate these elements in, in the 2021 program. We uh, always send out uh, provider uh, participant surveys and employ employer surveys. We have that feedback. We're also conduct conducting an evaluation on uh, Summerbridge as well. So all of the learnings that we gather from there will help inform uh, the best way forward for the, the new model. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, Lattice for Leaders is going to be, you know, um, utilize this this uh, this session this um, budget cycle um, uh, and again I want to implore you that um, that we look at and we take um, young people from those uh, communities that were um, disparately impacted by uh, COVID-19 um, you know, there's there's these glaring inequities, and um, I really would like to see that happen. Um, I, I know Ladders for Leaders is um, usually is for top tier high school students, um, and uh, and um, actually, uh, my it's been my experience. I haven't seen a lot of diversity in that as much diversity as um, as I think could be. So I, I really would like to see that um, that special consideration is given to those communities that were those zip codes that were hardest hit with COVID nineteen. Um, and with that, you know, given the challenges facing local small businesses and many placement sites for SYEP, we have heard from the providers that DYCD's assistance making connections with potential employer partners for the workplace challenge element of the Summer Bridge program, um, that uh, DYCD have been very active in recruiting employers to participate uh, for the summer. So can, will you continue to give them that type of um, assistance? And can um, providers expect an increased level of assistance um, in that area, especially since our small businesses are have been, you know, so greatly impacted. Yes, yeah, so our employer engagement team has been hard at work at developing these uh, opportunities and connections to the private sector. Uh, they were very instrumental in uh, getting a lot of the industry partners as part of the workplace challenge for Summerbridge. Um, are working now closely with the office of uh, MWBEs. And so that work will continue and we will continue to provide uh, support to our providers. And uh, we certainly encourage as many of our, um, our, our for-profit uh, companies here in New York City to uh, sign up and take part in our youth workforce development programs. And we also, our employer engagement team worked with Grant Associates to develop a remote internship guide and provided trainings to our providers on how to develop those remote internship opportunities and how to convert, how to work with businesses to convert what was previously an in-person opportunity to a remote opportunity. Um, we realized that that may be the way uh, a lot of internship opportunities, a lot of summer opportunities will be available in the summer uh, in a remote format and our providers never had previously had the opportunity or the, the kind of the know-how of how to develop those jobs. And so that's something we're working with them very, very closely to develop their capacity for the future. Thank you. And some of our not-for-profits were granted new school-based SYEP contracts immediately before the pandemic. Then those contracts were cut out of that opportunity. When the program numbers were halved, 
when the, the when they cut the program numbers in half, will they be brought back into uh, for consideration uh, this this go round? And um, like uh, for example, H two H's laboratory school for finance and uh, and tech uh, Brooklyn Academy of Letters. Um, Will they have the opportunity to be brought back into? Yes, the they will. Mm-hmm. Yes, they will be eligible to participate this summer. Um, and yes, we had uh, 33 new schools will be added to the, the career ready portfolio. Uh, 24 providers were uh, awarded uh, contract the new contracts. Uh, 10 of these providers are new to SYEP and or the career ready model. And uh, we will be working very closely with our new providers uh, to give them all the technical assistance and capacity building to ensure uh, a successful summer. Will they be included in the planning sessions? Yes, of course. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Was the city or DYCD reimbursed the $22 million for uh, for the TANF grant? for a summer 2020 bridge program. And um, we heard that uh, since the program was remote, the state ultimately decided the funds did not fall under the criteria as, uh, as usual, you know, for usual SYAP programming. So um, is there a plan and what is it to make up for the shortfall in funding? Yes, so shortly after the suspension and uh, work started to begin on the alternative program, we uh, shared a request uh, initially with uh, OTDA uh, requesting some high level waivers because we knew that at a minimum, uh, the model that we would be able to roll out would be remote um, and that we would pay stipends for uh, the program model. Um, obviously, the restrictive measures that TANF generally has includes only in-person uh, placements. We explained to them where we were as a city in terms of uh, the pause um, and that it just would not be possible um, given that time frame for us to uh, allow or even provide uh, in, in-person uh, work experiences. Um, we had some several uh, exchanges with our our colleagues at OTDA and uh, our last uh, correspondence with them was just prior to the start of Summer Bridge. Um, again, reiterating um, the program model, the need for the, the change in model um, and requesting uh, the funding. Um, but we're still in talks with the state and we're still working to, uh, in the hopes that they'll change the funding criteria and that we will receive uh, payment for the services rendered this past summer. Is there some type of advocacy or something that we could do um, on the city council's level to um, to sort of help move them uh, to uh, to uh, uh, grant the waiver and to consider the change in model. We would welcome all of your assistance and your advocacy. I'm sure would be uh, very valuable to us in in pleading our case. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and how did DYCD collect, go about collecting the data and information like timesheets um, this year and in the past? Because in the past, there was reference to DYCD being in the process of overhauling and standardizing data collection systems, specifically for SYEP. So what is the status of this process? Um, in addition, you know, has this streamlined things as well as the economic impact on our new system. Yeah, so out of necessity this past summer, we did have to switch to uh, not only online enrollment, but also Mm -hmm. capturing uh, time and and payroll information electronically as well. Uh, And certainly uh, this is something that uh, I think helped to uh, ensure everyone's health health and safety for one, um, but helped to smooth the process. It is something that we are looking to continue 
uh, into this coming summer. And we're working closely with our uh, software vendor who manages our uh, SYEP uh, programming um, and uh, ensuring that we're able to do this successfully at a larger scale for this coming summer. Yeah, um, I, I uh, highly recommend that that, that happen. Um, I know that the providers were, you know, very happy to see that that system put in place. Uh, so thank you for, for doing that. And, and that's, I think, one of the best practices that we need to maintain and, um, and improve upon. So uh, thank you for that. And then um, just give us an update on the operation of Work, Learn, Grow um, program since it resumed in November. Yes, um, so uh, program operations did begin on uh, November 9th. And uh, the Work, Learn and Grow model this year uh, really represents a true year round experience for uh, the participants. Young people who are a part of our uh, career ready uh, school portfolio and took part in Summer Bridge had the opportunity to take part in WLG this year. Uh, they had the opportunity to take part in one of three CUNY college courses, two of which uh, have the ability to uh, gain an academic credit uh, should they successfully pass. They also worked it with our providers in, on uh, career and exploration activities. We, the week of December 21st, started our internship phase. And this is where our young people are currently at work uh, in a variety of different uh, modalities, remote, in-person, uh, or a hybrid. And uh, Julia had mentioned uh, earlier that uh, we worked with Grant Associates, a technical assistance provider, to develop a re remote internship guide to help our uh, providers in cultivating remote internships, as well as helping employers understand how to convert an in-person uh, opportunity into a remote experience and ensuring that our young people are supported uh, throughout the process. So uh, we're several weeks into the internships um, and uh, our providers are monitoring those internships closely. Where there are in-person uh, internships, we also have contingency plans, uh, given the fact that we are in such an uncertain environment uh, with the pandemic. Uh, and if uh, participants need to be moved into a remote opportunity, that those opportunities are available to them. Thank you. Um, and I have a lightning round question for you, um, a yes or no. Uh, would you rate, uh, would you, would the agency rate the remote model of SYEP um, bridge program a success? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank you um, very much, um, uh, Deputy Commissioner and, and all of the um, DYCD staff for, um, for being here. Um, Please make sure that the information that Council Member Barron asked um, be submitted to to the chair. Um, and uh, I want to I want to say that um, we're we're being preemptive. We uh, we were taken by surprise last year that we were uh, totally totally xed out. Um, this year we're um, we're starting early. Uh, I'm glad to hear that we're we're starting um, from you know a full restoration um, point of view, uh, and um, and we're going to continue to to work to make sure that that's a reality. So I, I want to thank you, and I also want to ask you to uh, stay um, to hear what our young people have to say. Uh, we're doing all of this programming for them. And I think it's very important that you hear their voices, that you hear what their experiences were last year and what their hopes are for, um, for this year. So I'm asking you to stay um, because uh, somehow I got overruled. I had asked that the young people testify first because oftentimes um, the administration uh, gives us information that we really need to hear, but um, we don't, they don't get to hear 
what the actual experiences are of the people who are providing the services or who are the consumer of the services. And so um, I don't know how it happened. I'm saying this publicly that um, I, I, uh, I had it come into this hearing uh, with the knowledge that my young people were going to be able to speak first. Um, since that did not happen, I, I really, um, I need you to stay behind to hear what, um, what they have to say. And, um, and I thank you for cooperating with us um, on that. And um, I wanna say uh, a big welcome to my new colleague, um, Council Member Riley. Um, you're a welcome addition to this committee. Uh, I, I know you have a, a lot to give us and we have a lot to learn from you. So I wanted to welcome you. Um, and with that, um, I am now, let me see. Uh, on, on my script. I am now gonna turn it over to my committee policy analyst to call on the members from um, my youth panel to come to testify. And thank you again, uh, members of the administration for staying. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on the following students to testify. Jorge Morales, Carmen Lopez Villamil, Muhammad Dean, Kylian Quackrab, Latoya Beecham. Jorge Morales, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms announces that you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Mr. Jorge Morales. Yeah, I was, I was unable to get off mute, now I am. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning uh, to the youth, um, to the Council Youth Service Committee and to all of those watching this hearing. My name is Jorge Morales, I'm a junior at the University of Rochester and I'm also a Teen Sick Charge alum, a mentor and was one of the leaders of Teen Sick Charge Save SYEP campaign last year. Um, today, I am once again here to testify about uh, summer youth employment program. Um, I don't wanna make it a habit to, to come to all of these testimonies, to be completely frank with all of you. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has served as an accelerator in many ways, as it has magnified what was wrong even before the pandemic. Uh, We're currently living in a pivotal time period, uh, which will shape the recovery of our city and uh, its future. Um, and it is, it is at the toughest that we must strive to do much better than we have done in the past. And this is why Teen Sick Charge is here, uh, to fight for the future of our city and to fight for the future of our youth. Uh, the, youth the youth went out of their way this past summer uh, to plead for these opportunities, and they were served with 35,000 slots. Uh, I think that's something that, that is completely unfair um, and, and honestly just really disheartening. Um, this past summer, we were able to see what the lack of inadequate amount of communication did with regards to the rollout for Summer Bridge. Uh, throughout Teen, Teen Sick Charge campaign, and even after, we heard from multiple, multiple stories from providers and, and the youth about the great amount of uncertainty that they experienced. Over 130,000 youth applied for Summer Bridge in less than two weeks, maybe a week's notice. Um, this is proof that they, there is a tremendous demand uh, from the youth that these are opportunities that the youth need, uh, but not just the, the, the youth that the city need in order uh, to benefit from them now and in the future. Um, I think that this time around, we should make things more certain. Uh, we should not leave place for uncertainty. Uh, we must ensure that SYEP is secure and that the youth are part of its development process. I think that's a very important component that at time we miss, at, as at the end of the day, the youth are the ones that are gonna take part of these opportunities. And if they're not designed to some extent with a perspective from the youth, we're gonna be failing the youth like we did this past year. So I just really urge you all to include the youth in this process to some way or another. I know DYCD officials have said that they will, but we would really like to see how that would work. And we would like to see that implemented uh, rapidly as time moves on really quick. And from now on, we have to make sure that uh, th this occurs. Um, we need to make sure that those communities that were most affected by COVID-19 are, are served and are given what they deserve. Um, that, is, that is all that I have to say. 
Uh, thank you so much for allowing me some time to speak. And I'm going to pass it over uh, to whoever goes next. Thank you, Mr. Morales. We will now hear from Carmen Lopez Viemil, followed by Mohamed Din. Ms. Viemil? Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carmen Lopez Villamil. I'm a senior at Beacon and a member of Team Sick Charge. I worked on the SYP campaign last year. Um, and last summer, 137,087 young New Yorkers, that's over 137,000 of your constituents, applied for SYEP Summer Bridge, and only 35,198 got a spot. So that leaves over 100,000 of your constituents without jobs and without support last summer. This year, we will not settle for anything less than guaranteed placement. Every young person who applies must get a job. I mean, and more broadly, last summer was a mess and a largely avoidable one. Um, in early August, we were still receiving desperate emails from our peers, wondering whether SYP was happening, what had happened to their application, why their provider wasn't emailing them back. And we, a group of 16 and 17 year olds, were frantically trying to make SYP work for our peers with shockingly little information or support from DYCD. If that had been our only problem last year, I wouldn't be that mad. But weeks before that, we had to scramble to broadcast that SYP was back. We waded through clunky applications that wouldn't go through, uncertain deadlines, and widespread confusion. You guys left 137,000 of your constituents to find and apply for this program on their own. 102,000 never even got an email back. You passed a budget that left 102,000 youth behind. In the months before that, we were organizing rallies, meetings, and actions in response to the whim of the city council and DYCD that loved to cite our work publicly, but scarcely took the time to talk to us. No offense to you all, but similar to Jorge, I really don't want to have to keep testifying about SYEP. Um, or I'd like to come back with a happy report. I'd like to tell you that every applicant got a spot, that the process was clear and equitable, and that we all had fun doing it. Um, but that has to start with you guys. It has to start with young people planning this process, and that has to start now. If SYP is going to happen, we have to be included now. And it also means that we need a budget that ensures that every young person who applies for SYP will get a job. If you need any help with any of that, our emails are always open. Feel free to email us. We have time. We have young people, and we really do want to talk. We want to be a part of this process. Um, we just need the resources and the opportunities to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Mohamed Din, followed by Kailin Kwekra. Mr. Mohamed Din. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Mohamed Din. I'm a junior at Hunter College. And I just want to say that during coronavirus, there's a there's a tale that you know New York City is a tale where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and Corona really exposed that many students who came from privileged backgrounds they were able to move out of the city during the pandemic or they had basements they had their own rooms to themselves that allowed them to succeed in school many students focused on online learning completely and they didn't have to worry about having a job having to look for an internship and having to do these other things because they're privileged. For thousands of New York City students, SYEP is that program that guarantees money. And that money isn't just any money. For them, it's food on the table. For them, it's how they're gonna pay their mother's bills because their mom doesn't have insurance. For them, it's how they're gonna help their disabled father at home. For them, it's how they're gonna bring something home for their little brother or sister. So when SYEP got taken away, some of these other kids, like with online learning, school is so easy for them. They're doing internships. They're doing all of these things. And now 2020 and 2021 is just going to be a year where like, you know, their uh, transcripts and everything just went up. And for some of these other students, it was a year where they were scrambling. They couldn't find jobs. They were going through all of these things. And you see these divides just get stronger. So I really urge that I know you can't give us a house. You know, I know you can't give us a basement. I know you can't talk to our teachers and tell them to give us A's, but the least you can do is really make sure that in the greatest and biggest city in the world, we can give opportunities to students who want them. There's no reason why, and especially with everything that's happened, I really think that, look, we, we know what happened in the Capitol. We're not even asking for that. We're just asking for a huge fight for our budget because there's no reason that a lottery system should dictate 
who's going to get opportunities, who's going to bring home food on the table, whose family is going to starve and whose family isn't. So I know that, you know, a lot of adults, there's all this talk about, you know, this isn't the budget, this isn't in the budget, but it always seems like when it comes to education, when it comes to anything related to youth, we always get sidelined. I mean, we're not even in the table. We have three minutes to speak, but does our vote count when you vote on the budget? Like, is there any youth in city council that you're listening to who is a stakeholder in any of these decisions? Like, like they said, I don't, you know, I appreciate the opportunity for this, but we need more than just three minutes. We need youth to be stakeholders. And with everything that's happened with coronavirus, we cannot afford to just have certain kids get the opportunities and certain students not. So I'm calling on all of you guys, sorry, all of you all, if New York City is the greatest city in the world, and if we're going to beat Corona, let's do it by giving every single kid that wants a spot in SYEP this summer a chance. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. We will now hear from Kylie and Kuekrab, followed by Latoya Beecham. Ms. Kuekrab. Time starts now. Good morning, my name is Kylan Kreckrup and I'm a junior at Bard Manhattan, as well as a member of Teens Take Charge. I'm also in a final right now, and so I'd like to thank Council Member Rose for her remarks on making sure that youth voice gets prioritized. In the future, I would love it if you could have a little bit more heads up about when they're gonna speak so they can plan. Last spring, the summer youth employment program was eliminated completely, despite the city's youth struggling with loss of friends and family from COVID, the economic strain as jobs were lost and businesses closed, and the mental and emotional pain of isolation at home and online learning. This resulted in an overall insecurity about the future. To take back control, my peers and I worked tirelessly over the course of four months to save SYP. We launched a full-scale campaign using any available hours to draft op-eds. We published eight, promote our own petition with over 40,000 signatures, organize protests online and in person, develop our own plan for an equitable, socially distant SYP, and finally come up with a report detailing all of that, which will be coming out in the coming weeks. As a result of our efforts, opportunities for 35,000 young people were restored. However, despite them, the efforts of high schoolers 40,000 SYP slots were eliminated, taking away opportunities from youth who were desperate to provide assistance to their, to their families during the pandemic. Over 102,000 applicants who sought summer employment and a chance to develop professional and working skills were refused. It's easy to be desensitized by numbers, so let's visualize how many people our city failed. 102,000 of our city's ambitious, dedicated, and hardworking youth were rejected from, from SYP. With 102,000 youth denied access to SYP, you could fill City Field, you know, the big place in Queens where the Mets play, two and a half times. Give yourself a moment to sit with the magnitude of just how many New Yorkers were let down by a budget that failed to prioritize them. What is clear from this, what has been clear from the start is that SYP is a cornerstone of, inve of investing in youth by providing paid jobs and opportunities. These opportunities help bridge gaps in work-based learning, financial literacy, and future employment, left gaping by current inequalities of our city's social and educational systems. Youth jobs create stability. Youth jobs inspire passion. Youth jobs foster learning. Youth jobs build the future, the future that is out there once the COVID-19 pan pandemic recedes and the youth of our city have become the city's adults. So in the coming budget negotiations, I urge you to find funding so that every New Yorker can build a future they deserve. Because at this point, that really shouldn't be a debate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kuekrab. We will now hear from Latoya Beecham. Ms. Beecham. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Latoya Beecham and I am a junior at Hero High School in the South Bronx. I'm also a leader at Team State Charge and here to hear is Youth Policy Advisor. I would like to say thank you to the New York City Council and Council Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to testify in support of New York City Summer Youth Employment Program, SYP. I wrote a whole testimony, but that might be a little bit too long to read in three minutes, and I want to get to the main point. So instead, I will give you three details or three facts that I want to resonate with you. Number one is that SYP is the largest youth employment program in the country and is often the first opportunity you get to have access to gain skills and experience based on whatever field or role you want to pursue in the near future. 
SYP often serves as a foundation to building upon your knowledge and understanding when it comes to learning how the real world works, from W9 forms to timesheets, things that you wouldn't learn in class, especially when it comes to budgeting. Whew, sorry especially when it comes to budgeting. Another fact that I'd like you to know is that SYP was completely canceled, cut, finished, and done for this year. And as NYC youth, we didn't take no for an answer. We noticed that this was unfair and we spoke out about it. From morning Zoom calls to mass emails to petitions and even nights where we stayed up to perfect our craft, it was not easy and we did it alone. And it was one of those things that didn't go unnoticed. This should show how near and dear SYP is for youth but we, keep, we kept going and we stayed motivated and we're still pushing regardless of the answer that we get. And my third and final takeaway is that to center youth voice, we need youth voice and just overall youth in the room where it happens and decisions that are being made because countless times we don't have a say and we're expected to deal with the repercussions, negative or positive. And SYP was one of the cuts that were negative. And if we didn't fight back, we know we wouldn't, we, we would have had went a year without learning, well, I would have went a year without learning what I should have. And that would have left me with the job of filling the gap myself. And often that is the case. You can have someone who wants to be a doctor but is stuck working at McDonald's, but isn't sure where to get the experience or exposure to have access to these opportunities, which proves the importance of SYP and the importance of connecting jobs to education, because not only are you learning for your future, but you're able to apply what you're learning in schools while gaining experience. So I say to invest more in youth advancement, invest more in youth voice, invest more into these voices that are often silenced and don't have don't have a say in what goes on because it's unfair. And we deserve more, especially because when I first came here from Jamaica, they say that America is a land of opportunities. And this 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 is a great opportunity to speak up about what's happening, but the fact that I have to speak up and that it's happening. Time is expired. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now turn to questions from Chair Rose. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you, Jorge, Jorge, um, Carmen, Mohammed, Kai, and Latoya for, um, for standing up for uh, saying uh, straight out, not um, without any trepidation about the realities of, of what young people in New York City um, are, are experiencing, um, the lack of, of services, uh, resources that um, you've had to uh, endure. I wanna thank you for your strong um, advocacy uh, teens take charge um, have been very vocal and um, and very active and and played an important role in um, in getting um, even a portion of uh, the youth's funding restored. Uh, we went from zero to um, 35 million. Um, but I wanted to ask you um, had had any of you participated in the planning um, in the past? And um, have any of you been invited to participate in the planning for SYEP uh, going forward going this year? I take it that's a no? No. Uh, are we getting muted? Oh, yeah. okay. Can you unmute? Okay. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Jorge. The host needs to unmute us in order in order for us to right. speak. I just wanted to quickly note before we got into questions that there's a couple other youth voices that weren't able to get listed in that list. And I think okay. it would be amazing to hear from them. Uh, some of them are Sierra, um, uh, Miriam also, and Adam. Uh, I, I, they had prepared testimonies for today's hearing as well. I just wanted to quickly note that. Why were they not included um, on the list? Chair, um, they are included in other public testimony panel. Okay. All of them, yes. Okay. We'll hear from them later on. Okay. All right. Um, we'll make sure that their voices are heard. Thank you, Jorge. Um, 
so uh, we heard from the administration that they're they're planning to have conversations with the providers and the advocates um, going forward next month. Um, I, I just wanted to know if you had um, any of you had been invited to participate. If Teens Take Charge had uh, was one of the groups that were invited to take um, to be a part of that. And if not, then um, the deputy commissioner is still on um, on this Zoom. Um, I'm asking that uh, the youth groups and youth advocates be included in the planning. And I, I don't. I guess they they can't they can't respond. Um, uh, we are, I want you to know that the council is fighting for universal SYEP. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's been our goal. Um, and, you know, going forward, that's, that's where we're trying to get to. So um, I want you to know we heard you and um, that we're going to move forward in that direction. Okay, um, are there any questions from any of the council members? Council members, do you have any yeah. questions? Council member Chin has a question. Um, council member Chin, please proceed. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to really thank this uh, panel of our you know, young leaders. I, I just want to reassure you that Chair Rose and I, from the beginning, uh, I think this is our 12th year um, on yeah. the council, yeah. and this will be our last budget. Um, from the beginning, under the Bloomberg administration, we fought very hard to save summer youth program um, and other youth pro after school program. And Universal has always been the goal. And working together with other council member and now our public advocate, uh, Jamani William, Universal SYEP was always the goal. Yes, and sir. I think the year before, when we finally got to over 70,000, um, mm -hmm. it was a milestone. And yeah. we thought it would be a great you know, step forward for us to continue. And then the pandemic hit. Um, but I'm really glad to hear from uh, the, SY, um, the administration, the uh, DYCD, that at least in the preliminary budget, they have the money in there. So at least we're in a good starting point, That's but true. we gotta continue to fight. And I wanted to really uh, thank, you know, Teen Take Charge and our youth leaders. Your advocacy is really um, tremendous. And also all the uh, youth organization and nonprofit provider who've been doing this for so many years to continue to fight for our young people. And, uh, and we gotta continue to do that because I myself benefited from an SYEP when I was in high school and really made a difference in my life in terms of, you know, the income, but the work experience. Like I have never even shopped in lower Manhattan because I grew up in Chinatown, but because my job was on John Street in lower Manhattan for the New York Telephone Company, I was able to, you know, gain work experience and really build confidence and I think that is so important to our young people. And I think you have our commitment from the council. We will fight very hard to make sure that we get the funding for SYEP. And we're still pushing for that goal. And you got to work on our mayor and the administration, but also the state and federal government, because they have to also put in the funding. And we know how great the program is. And I really you know, urge all the young people uh, to get involved talk to your council member, talk to your state elected, and really let's all work together uh, towards this goal of universal uh, summer youth program. So thank you again for coming to testify and thank you to Chair Rowe for your, your leadership. Thank you, council member um, Chen. You know, uh, with you behind us, you know, we, we can't fail. Thank you. Um, are there yeah, any, we have a question from Council, Council Member Lewis. Council Member Lewis, please proceed. Time starts now. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Rose, for hosting um, this conversation today. I took some time to listen to the administration and their feedback. Um, some of it was good, some of it was lackluster, um, but I look forward to further conversations. I just wanted to share with the youth, to, I have a question for them, but I also wanted to sh tell them thank you so much for your testimony um, this afternoon for having this conversation, for participating. I wanna let you all know that Chair Rose, Councilmember Chen, Councilmember Barron, Public Advocate Williams have fought really hard for universal SYEP. I participated in SYEP when I was young um, and I worked for a council member, former council member, Jermani Williams, who fought hard for universal SYEP with council member Chen and Chair Rose and so many others. We need you to support us. So listening to your testimony and saying that you wanna be a part of the conversation, you wanna be a part of the de decision-making, I'm gonna ask one of you, cause I don't know how much time we have, what does that look like? So that Chair Rose has something to take back to the rest of the administration. And also wanna piggyback off of what council member Chin said, the decision is not just on the council members, it's really also on the mayor. Um, and those in the state. So we want to partner with you. Chair Rose wants to partner with you. She wants to work with you. And we are going to support her and undergird her so that she can give you what you need. But we need to know what that looks like. We need to know what the framework is. So if you could share with us, uh, a few of you mentioned you want to be a part of the decision-making process. Give us some idea of what that looks like. Thank you, Chair Rose. Thank you. I can quickly go since I'm unmuted, um, but I think that basically starts with meeting with us. Uh, it starts with accepting to meet with us. We reached out to multiple of your offices and many of them uh, didn't, we didn't get to schedule a meeting. So I, that, that's a huge barrier. If you all can't listen to us, uh, you know, sometimes when we talk to your reps, that's amazing as well. But the, the message gets swirled around. It's not directly as to speaking with you, right? The youth has to know that you're prioritizing their voices. So you, you have to meet with them. That's, that's for starters. We can meet and discuss uh, further uh, how that looks in practice. And uh, I mean, we would love to. We can follow up with that. Thank you. I would like to take the moment to remind council members that if they would like to pose a question to use the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, there are no questions from council member. Chair Rose. Okay. Um, again, I, I want to thank this uh, very articulate panel. Um, we, we heard you. We're behind you. We, um, we are willing to lead the way so that we can get the, um, get, get the ear of the administration and, um, and, get, uh, and achieve our goal. Um, our goals are the same. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm sure this will be a strong partnership that will prevail. So um, I wanna thank you again for your time. Um, and, and we will speak um, offline in terms of, of what this um, framework or what the paradigm should look like. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. At this moment, I would like to remind that for public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function on Zoom. You will be called after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you start your testimony. The next panelists will be in the following order. Adam Philogen, Sierra Frazier, and Miriam Chowdhury. Adam Philogen, please. Time starts now. Good morning. I am Adam Philogen. I am a 16-year-old junior at the High School for Youth and Community Development, residing in Queens, New York. I am also a member of Teens Take Charge. This pandemic has flipped and changed lives in ways like no other. The trauma that comes with these deaths from the virus are agonizing. Young people are struggling with traumatic stress and the many different forms that it comes in due to the virus. 
As a city, we must strive to get to a comfortable state where everyone feels safe in their own body and stable socially as well as financially. With our youth, SYEP is the first step. The Summer Youth Employment Program has provided for the youth in a multitude of ways. However, when this pandemic hit and everything shifted to online services, that changed. With limited seats and limited funding towards this program, it doesn't allow for the youth to garner working experience and accountability as well as financial stability. Especially with the virus still going around, despite an up and coming vaccine, the funds received from working SYP could be used to greatly benefit and stabilize households. Beforehand, working and internships haven't necessarily been appealing to me until just recently when my mother brought it to attention. Now that I have gained significant interest, I am more than passionate about the topic as other children and peers younger or older or even the same age as me could significantly benefit from this opportunity. This experience serves as a better source of income rather than turning to other things such as illegal activity or selling items that won't generate much profit as a result of school being out over the summer and people having nothing to do with their lives. There is no alternative to SYP for us. SYP serves a major purpose and as a stepping stone to all that apply for it and all of the appliers should be granted this opportunity regardless of their situation. With that being said, the program as a whole should be and needs to be expanded to at least 150,000 members of the youth. As New York City youth, I ask you to profoundly expand and improve SYP. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will next hear from Sierra Fraser. Ms. Fraser. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Sierra Fraser. I'm 18 years old and I'm also a Teen State Charge member. Um, I'm a freshman at Smith College and I wrote this testimony May 2020, so a lot of the things apply to then, but I still think it's a really relevant conversation to have. Um, a mother's biggest fear is not being able to put food on her table. Her greatest wish is that she'll never have to ask her children to contribute financially. Her favorite words are, it's okay, you can wait until you're older to provide for the family. Right now, just focus on school, baby. But this is where we bump heads because I want to provide now, mom. I've officially lost track of the amount of times that I've applied for summer youth. Not the amount of times I've participated in it, but the amount of times I've been rejected. I haven't been called back for jobs elsewhere and summer youth won't take me. So what age will I finally get my first work experience? My fingers were crossed that this summer would be the first time I had my own money. For, not, for once, not the birthday money, not the Christmas money, not the lunch money, but my money. Except now I'll be a freshman in college who's never worked. I want to surprise my hardworking mom with a gift or two sometimes. My mom shouldn't have to do all of the surprising. I want to buy groceries and necessities for the house when they run out. My mom shouldn't have to do all of the buying. I'm a freshman in college with a mom that will be paying room and board, and I never wanted my first job to be the one that I work on campus. Although I wasn't chosen last summer, or the summer before, or the summer before that, I had hope in the program that this year, the year of COVID and many losses, the year that I'd graduate on a pre-recorded ceremony, the year 2020 would be my lucky year. Not only did it provide for over 75,000, but it rejected a quantity that we'll never know. Some service options have additional legibility requirements, clearly requirements I never had. I live within the five boroughs and I'm legally allowed to work. That's what the website said I needed. So what else, what, what am I missing now? Sorry, excuse me. The program's binoculars don't see everyone and there are a portion of teenagers that want the opportunity so bad, but can't get it. Officials say the absence of summer youth will push families to change their summer plans, but you can't just tell low-income families struggling to keep meals on their table to change the plans they were relying on to keep their household economically stable. A paycheck for a 16-year-old is a paycheck for a mother, for a sibling, for school supplies, and for clothing. One check is split several ways, put to more than one thing to ensure that the whole family can take care of itself. Giving up on this program will completely deplete the probability of some teens ever getting a job. From me and thousands of youth in New York City, I'm asking you to expand and improve SYP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will next hear from Miriam Chowdhury, also of the Teen Stake Charge. Ms. Chowdhury. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Miriam Chowdhury. I'm a sophomore at the Young Women's Leadership School of the Bronx and a Teen Stake Charge organizer. I'm also a mentee at Minds Matter, a 
a participant at Cornell Big Data for a big policy program and inter at Guggenheim Museum and Pathfinders. My experience with COVID has been very stressful. Seeing the deaths of so many people in the world and in my family has played a very negative role on me. Mentally and emotionally, it's like losing a part of me. This pandemic is very hard for us. We aren't getting enough socialization time. Usually we can play with our friends at school or the park, but for me, that is not an option. Employment programs like internships and SYEP can give me the environment to socialize and work on other necessary skills. I have been turned down for jobs because I lacked experience and SYEP could have helped me with that. SYP could have helped me because it would have given me a chance to feel to see and feel how it is to be employed, the pros and cons of working. The application for SYP last year was very hectic, an application 12 pages long just to not be accepted. SYP is employment based off of lottery, which I believe is unfair. Everyone deserves a spot. Students take the time out of their day to do a 12 page long application just for the page to crash, the application not going through and not being accepted. SYP must be expanded because every student who wants to gain experience from SYP should be provided that opportunity. SYP would be so significant during this pandemic because there are so many families struggling as we speak and students can help their family out with the employment they are provided through SYP. There are businesses in my community that will benefit from SYP workers. For example, small businesses like family owned pharmacy and district office or community centers. Most of the time my summer consists of staying at home bored since we are in a pandemic and have limited opportunities. The summer should be a time where I can put my time to good use but without the resources, how can I do so? I hope everyone gains a better understanding of SYP and why employment matters to me. It is important for you to listen to us because we are the future of New York City. We are fighting to make the city better for everyone and expanding SYEP is a start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to Chair Rose for questions for this Teen State Charge panel. Again, um, I. I think it's sad that um, that your comments uh, were meant for 2020 and that they are still very relevant today, Sierra. Um, you know, I um, I had hoped that we would not have had to face that last year. Um, you know, we were we were on a roll. We were incrementally in, increasing the number of young people that we were able to accommodate in SYEP. Um, still moving and pushing toward universal SYEP, um, and then to have the rug pulled completely out from under us um, was really devastating. Um, and so we're we're having this hearing to. Um, to find out, uh, to to get on the record, you know, um, the outcomes of of the the you know of all that happened with SYEP last year, and to be preemptive so that this year we we won't face those same um, those same hurdles and 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 stumbling blocks, with the exception of the budget. And so we're trying to get ahead of it. Um, uh, I was glad to hear the administration say that we were starting from uh, the previous level, not the um, not 2020 level. Um, and we're gonna continue the fight. And I agree with you, um, it's really difficult. Uh, I think all of us can ex um, know the experience of being in a lottery and not winning. I think it was $780 million uh, last night that was up and um, none of us uh, were able to, to say that we were winners and I, I know um, we were not pleased with that. So um, I, I just, um, it's, it's a good place to start the, um, that we look at the lottery system, um, but um, we would have to then, if we had universal universal SYEP, then there would be no need for a lottery. And so that's why that's our goal. So I thank you. I, I don't have any questions. Um, 
uh, do any of my uh, colleagues have any questions for for these uh, wonderfully articulate young people? So I would like to remind council members, if you would like to pose a question, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. There seems to be no questions. So um, I would like to announce the next panel. The next panel will be Carolyn Blair of Good Shepherd Services, Jordan Hall of Brooklyn Defender Services, and Angel Saccarello of University Settlement Society of New York. Ms. Blair. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Rose and the council members of the Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to submit testimony on the oversight hearing on the Summer Youth Employment Program. My name is Carolyn Blair and I am the Fair Futures Co-Supervisor at Good Shepherd Services where I supervise four coaches with a caseload of 15 youths each whom support youth in foster care between the ages of 11 and 21. I have been employed with Good Shepherd Services for the past seven years, all in family foster care. Before this role, I served two years as a case planner, two and a half years as an education specialist for youth from birth to fifth grade. Today, my testimony will emphasize on the role coaches and career specialists play in supporting over 35 youth who participated in SYP last year and work remotely at the sites Common Point Queens Children's Aid and the CUNY Research Foundation. The supports I will speak of are offered to youth in care year round by coaches who are trained in trauma-informed and strength-based approaches and build a trusting relationship with the young person. Coaches also provide ongoing social emotional support and work one-on-one -on -one with youth to develop goals based on their interests. Coaches are always looking for opportunities and experiences that help youth become self-sufficient. Coaches provide essential support to youth during their SYP placement. Coaches connected youth to members of the community and the career specialist partnered with the SYP placement team to ensure youth have the needed supports to be successful. Coaches help youth to navigate and sustain their participation in SYP placement. Career specialists also schedule weekly calls with SYEP placement supervisors to ensure both the supervisor and the youth's needs were being met. Coaches scheduled frequent check-ins with youth to support them throughout the placement to discuss connectivity issues, also discuss effective communication strategies, and to monitor progress. Coaches help prepare youth for potential challenges by hosting monthly workshops for youth around the topics of navigating the remote workplace, video fatigue, and professionalism. Coaches and career specialists also support youth in obtaining, collecting, and submitting vital documentation online for SYEP. Some of the key takeaways youth gain from SYEP program include effective communication skills, career advancement, and navigating relationships between youth and their supervisors. Additionally, youth were connected to the Hats and Ladders Career Building Network. These opportunities provided youth vital support in real life experiences and developed their careers. Despite the immense difficulties presented by the ongoing COVID crisis- Time expired. Thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony. Thank you so much. We will next hear from Mr. Jordan Hall, followed by Angel Saccarello, Mr. Hall. Time starts now. Uh, good morning, and uh, my name is Jordan Hall. I'm a senior youth advocate on the adolescent representation team at Brooklyn Defender Service. I want to thank Chair Rose and the Committee on Youth Services for holding this hearing today. Uh, BDS's adolescent representation team provides a specialized legal services and social work support to young people who are arrested in Brooklyn. We represent about 2,000 adolescents, 13 to 21 each year, the majority of whom are Black, black or Latinx and live in low-income communities. Uh, the Summer Youth Employment Program has been an asset for youth we serve and for low-income Black and Brown youth across the city. In 2019, 81% of SYEP participants were Black or Brown, and 84% were enrolled in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Queens, or the Bronx. Our research on SYEP has indicated that participation increases likelihood of employment in the following year and reduces the likelihood of incarceration or death. 
SYEP is a step towards career success. You who participate in a program receive on the job training. They gain necessary skills and they receive supportive mentoring from their supervisors. The program gives young people a, uh, something to look forward to. It provides structure during the summer and it boosts confidence. Uh, for youth involved with uh, justice involvement, um, including youth at crossroads and juvenile detention facilities, SYEP may be one of the few job opportunities available. Uh, participants, they aren't judged by the, the charges that they're facing, but they're allowed to be young people and given the same opportunities to learn and grow as their peers. Uh, we ask you to carefully consider what message it sends to our young people when we cut some of you employment programs to afford to pay the officers who terrorize our communities, or when teachers are shortchanged while the NYPD blows past its annual overtime allotment by 100 million um, yet again. If the city wants to invest in young people, it must create opportunities for young people to feel safe, to thrive, and to see viable, successful future in themselves and their communities. The investment in SYAP is an indication to young New Yorkers in, that their lives and their time have value. Where society allocates its budget is a, is a statement of its values. We encourage the city council to consider those values when determining if SYAP will be funded in the next year's budget. Thank you again for holding this important hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Mr. Angel Saccarello. Mr. Sa Time starts now. Uh, hello, my name is Angel Saccarello. I am the program director for University Settlement at Campos Plaza Community Center. I want to thank the committee for allowing me to testify today. Uh, our agency as a whole has been committed to the development of youth and young adults in the community center um, for, for years. Um, as, a, as a center director, we have a unique perspective. We offer programming for participants as young as kindergarten uh, and all the way up through adulthood. Uh, so we're able to see our participants develop and grow. Uh, the SYEP program is such an essential part to that development, especially as these young people are transitioning into adulthood. Um, without these programs available to our participants consistently, um, we have a lot of difficulty uh, in terms of providing them with the resources that they need. Um, our programs try to emphasize continued support for young adults. Um, these programs are also essential for the financial support um, that is needed, especially during uh, our current situation in the pandemic. Um, on top of that, when we are not able to offer consistency, especially in a time where everything seems to be uncertain, um, our participants tend to lose trust not only in specific programs, um, but also in the city as a whole. Um, when these young people feel that they have been left out, when they feel that they are operating solely on their own and they have no other options, that's when poor decisions are made. Um, that's when alternatives that we, want, we don't want them to go down, uh, uh, we don't want them to participate in start to happen. Um, so it's essential that these programs are not only maintained um, but also expanded because in my experience, um, the need has not shrunk, the need has grown. And it's very, um, in the 10 years that our center has been uh, a work site for uh, SYEP, uh, we've never been able to get all of the participants that need a spot, a spot in the program. Um, and so a lot of our participants don't have that job readiness for future opportunities. Um, and especially in the current climate, they need that job readiness more than ever before. Uh, we're entering an era where tech and video and remote um, are now essential, uh, and they need to have opportunities to practice those skill sets before they're sent out there. Um, also, we need to make sure that we're maintaining a role modeling in a safe space, um, and having these uh, SYEP is a, is a powerful tool um, for our participants uh, in terms of making sure that their needs are being met, that we're able to maintain those connections with them, uh, and with their families. Uh, so I ask the, the council um, to make sure that this program continues to be a priority, um, that we are reaching out and uh, getting these services provided early, um, because as a provider, the more time we have to actually implement this program, the more successful those programs are. Uh, and we need, uh, we need to make sure that that is uh, something that's high on our needs. Time next. expired. Thank you. We will now turn to questions from Chair Ross for this panel. Uh, no, I don't. 
Thank you. I just want to thank you for your um, your hard work, your advocacy, um, and for uh, documenting the um, adverse impacts that uh, the lack of having uh, SYEP uh, workforce development programs available to our young people have on you know um, on our communities as a whole. So I, I want to thank you for. Um, for giving us the statistics and the data, but also for working um, to combat some of these problems that we're facing. So I, I thank you for your work and advocacy. I would like to remind again that if council members would like to pose a question, please use the raise and function on Zoom. There are no questions, so we will move on to our next panel which will be Makita Murray of Sheltering Arms, Simon Wang of the Chinese American Planning Council, and Erin Hudson Thomas of Queens Botanical Garden. Ms. Murray? Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Makita Murray and I'm the Career Development Specialist on the Foster Care and Adoption Team at Sheltering Arms. Thank you Chair Rose and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. Sheltering Arms is one of the city's largest providers of education, youth development, and community and family well-being programs for the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. We serve nearly 15,000 children, youth, and families each year and employ more than 12,000 staff from across New York City. We join UNH in urging the city to commit to serving 75,000 youth in SYEP this summer to 2021 and calling on DYCD to include providers in the planning of SYEP for this summer. Prior to the pandemic, the application process for SYEP was easy and all youth needed was to complete an application and ensure that they had the proper identification. The summer of 2020 was totally different from the application to the placement. After the city reversed its decision and restored SYEP, I had only seven days to submit the applications for all of our youth. This required me to work overtime for a week straight just to ensure everything was submitted on time. For the youth who did get placed, many placements consisted of workshops and answering emails. Younger youth in these placements found it similar to their pre-COVID placements and felt that they were actually working and not just lounging around. However, the older youth who are more used to the physical aspect of work felt as if their placement wasn't challenging enough for them. These youth were able to complete their tasks ahead of time and found themselves bored. Added to this, several youth didn't get paid until several weeks into their placement and one youth specifically who did not receive his last pay payment. This was a huge impact on the youth because they felt like they were being taken advantage of. SYP has been an important resource to the youth because it is one time of the year when they are able to earn their own money without going without or waiting. Many of these youth come from low income families or in foster care where they are reliant on others to care for them. SYP gives them the, change to the chance to be independent and reap the benefits of their hard work. SYP has been a huge impact has had a huge impact on the youth, already fragile mental health, and without it, I worry that their mental health would be impacted more. After all of the challenges that have transpired and the unknowns in the upcoming year, many of our youth are really looking forward to SYEP 2021. I currently have youth calling and telling me to let them know when they can apply for SYEP. I do hope that we are awarded funds for SYEP this year and that we are given ample time to fix the kinks of what last year created. The city must commit now to serving the 75,000 youth in SYEP this summer and DYCD must engage providers in planning the process. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and for your commitment to our youth. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Simon Wang, followed by Aaron Hudson Thomas. Mr. Wang. I'm starts now. Whew, glad to be here. Good afternoon, Chair Rose and members of the New York City Council Committee on Youth Services. It gives me great pleasure to be here and testify. My name is Simon Wang and I am an SYP program director at the Chinese American Planning Council, where we are the trusted partner to more than 60,000 individuals and families each year. As one of the city's largest youth employment providers, CPC greatly appreciates Chair Rose, the Youth Service Committee, and the council members who fought for the restoration of SYP last summer. CPC has been providing SYP in our communities for years. We have seen the impact that providing meaningful summer experience has on our youth and communities. 
Last summer, SYAP was needed more than ever as families struggled to make ends meet and local businesses struggled to stay afloat. While we appreciate the city's decision to partially restore SYP last year, we found that the effort was simply not enough. Too many young people and work sites were regrettably left out of a program that would have benefit, benefited them greatly. In New York City, SYP is as much a part of the teenage experience as prom and graduation. I'm pretty sure they didn't get any of that last year. <laughs> Although we are still in the midst of a pandemic wrecking havoc on our economy, it's a shame that SYP is continually used as a budget negotiation item and consequently that so many young people lose out on the monumental experiences provided by the program. If the goal of SYP is to provide financial literacy and work readiness skills, real world experience and income to youth while simultaneously supporting worksite partners, there is no greater opportunity to fully fund one of the city's most successful youth initiatives and safety net program. As adults, we tend to overlook the skills and knowledge that young sometimes thinking that we have everything to offer them. The pandemic is a prime example of how our SYP worksites could have benefited from the value and perspective of youth workers through a fully funded program. As many companies were moving online and leveraging various social media platforms, local mom and pop shops did not have the skills or knowledge to make that adjustment. SYP participants should have been at the forefront of supporting with this transition. I strongly implore you to continue fighting for our communities. This is a commitment to funding 75,000 slots for SYP this summer. Providers need to be assured and can have the ability to plan educational work opportunities for our youth without the threat of another SYP contract suspension. We need to continue supporting the city's economic recovery through SYP this summer, but with the flexibility of doing so in person and remotely. We already know the positive impacts that SYP has. The city must continue investing in our younger generation so we may have a brighter and more skilled community. As for off script, um, I am 26 years old. I think I applied as early as like uh, possible, I think like 14 for SYP. So I've only been picked once. <laughs> But the funny thing about being picked once was that it had a huge impact on my life because I think I got picked when I was in my 20s. Um, I actually started working. Time expired. Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> finish it. Just finish your sentence. Finish it. Oh, okay. Sentence. Okay. Um, so that one, year, that one summer I worked at um, SYP, it really helped a lot because I used that money to pay for my, um, my college classes because I wanted to take a summer class to graduate earlier. And then um, behold, I graduated during that summer and eventually I started working at CPC, right? Where I worked as, um, because I'm a provider. And here I am, you know, I am a program director. Uh, you know, I'm <laughs> feeling good, right? I look, I look pretty good now. Uh, I just really appreciate it. Thank I you. kids should have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're proud of you. <laughs> I'm proud too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Erin Hudson-Thomas. Ms. Hudson-Thomas. Time starts now. Thank you so much. My name is Erin Hudson thomas I'm the coordinator of volunteers at Queens Botanical Garden. Thank you committee members for pro providing this opportunity for me to testify today. So Queens Botanical Garden is located on 39 acres of city owned land in Flushing, Queens. Uh, we are the place where people, plants and cultures meet. Public gardens and parks are even more important now than ever. And we offer a safe, beautiful and interesting place, nature heals. Even in this pandemic year, we had 165 people come to the garden. The garden was able to host socially distanced weddings and birthday parties and public programs. People who came to the garden loved that it made them feel like life was almost normal again. This would not be possible without the hard work of our entire garden staff. Prior to COVID, we welcomed 2000 community volunteers and young interns annually to help keep the gardens green and growing. This includes the significant contributions of our SYEP interns. QBG was proud to host up to 40 participants each summer. And over this six week program, we strive to provide meaningful job skills and experience that position the youth for success in their future careers. The participants come from diverse economic backgrounds and we focus to make sure they learn important job skills when they're with us. Their work reaches all corners and departments of the garden. To make this happen, we partner with local community organizations and diversity programs such as Chinese Planning Council, Korean Community Services, Common Point Queens, Frank Chinook, 
Frank Sinatra 993 School, Lexington School for the Deaf, along with many, many others. And this year, through the pandemic's many impacts, the garden continued to serve as a steadfast internship resource for our community's youth. Last summer, QBG hosted 35 interns, seven on site, and 28 virtual interns. The drop in on site support was strongly felt by our team this year. Queens Botanical staff never stopped bringing people, plants, and cultures together. The contribution of our volunteers and interns help us to remain an urban oasis for visitors to find peace, relaxation, and inspiration among the wonders of nature. The SYP program's endurance will be an important component of the ability of the garden and our community to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to Chair Ross for questions for this panel. I have none. Just gratitude. Okay. I would like to remind council members to use the raise and function on Zoom to ask questions. There are no questions, so we're moving to the next panel, which will consist of James Lee of the Wildlife Conservation Society, JT Falcon of the United Neighborhood Houses, Daniel Fuller of Forestdale Inc and Lazar Trishan of Here to Hear. James Lee, please. Time starts now. Hi, uh, I wanna thank Chairwoman Rose on, and the Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to testify today for the Summer Youth Employment Program. My name is James Lee. I'm a freshman at the Macaulay Honors College at Hunter College, and I'm also a youth employee at the Wildlife Conservations Bronx Zoo. Like many of our cultural institutions group uh, colleagues, uh, WCS relies on SYEP youth to contribute to the engaging experience for our visitors at all five parks. As one of its largest providers, we definitely felt the loss of the program last year, not only in the loss of support and talent, but in wage replacement and a diverse talent pipeline. Of the 250 SYEP students who were with our organization in 2019, many were hired by WCS uh, in a part-time capacity, even after the end of SYEP. We all understand that these are tight times for the city budget, but they are far more difficult for difficult times for people like me and the families that rely on SYP, not only for income, but for that first job experience that teaches us about the world, ourselves, and real world careers. It is important that the city's budget is not balanced on the backs of our most vulnerable youth. Uh, my first work experience and placement in SYP was working at a barbershop in Jamaica, Queens during the summer of 2017. Uh, it was in that role that I really learned uh, work etiquette, etiquette and responsibility. And after that, I participated in the Bronx Zoo's Discovery Guide Volunteer Program in 2018. And uh, I was looking for a way to continue doing what I loved at the Bronx Zoo while also earning an hourly wage. So I was fortunate enough to get, get a placement in SYP at the Bronx Zoo during the summer of 2019, facilitating hands-on educational activities for, for zoo visitors. Largely due to my experience through SYEP and the leadership experience it provided me, in, in 2020, I was hired as a seasonal employee at the Bronx Zoo again. In this role, I helped to create an educational, safe, and welcoming experience for all our visitors. And I felt extremely fortunate to have had a meaningful job during these challenging times, especially after being rejected by Summerbridge 2020. Uh, were not my experience in SYEP, I'm not sure these doors would have been open to me. Uh, programs like SYEP are often the only opportunity for low-income youth to gain paid work experience and build their professional skills. COVID-19 has caused dispor disproportionately destructive economic impacts in some of our most vulnerable communities. It is a vital resource to low-income communities, and any cuts to the program will have massive negative consequences on those who need help the most. Again, I want to thank council, the council for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the tens of thousands of young, young New Yorkers who stand to benefit greatly from SYEP. Thank you. We will now hear from JT Falcon, followed by Danielle Fuller. Falcon, please. Time starts now. Hey there, uh, I'm JT Falcon. I'm a policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. Um, I work on SYP as well as other uh, programs that serve youth with workforce services. Um, for over 20 years, United Neighborhood Houses has led the campaign for summer jobs, which was created in response to federal funding cuts that threaten summer jobs for youth. Um, we've worked at the city, state, 
um, level to increase funding for this vital program. And um, over the years have watched it grow to the 75,000 young people that were served in 2019. Um, <clears throat> I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'm not gonna go uh, too, too deep into all of the reasons why SYP is great. I, I really appreciate the chair um, and the council members who uh, have, have committed to fighting for a full restoration of 75,000 slots. I also think that um, hearing this rhetorical shift that, that folks are excited to think about expansion this year and that um, we acknowledge that 75,000 isn't enough, that um, that ultimately we need to get to a place where every young person who applies for an opportunity should be granted one is really exciting. Um, because of UNH's role where we convene and work very closely with the providers who roll out this program, um, we, we have lots of thoughts and opinions about ways that the system will need to be tweaked um, in order to allow for that capacity, right? It's, it's not just a situation where in order to double the, the estimates for universality are about 150,000 slots would be, would be reaching universal um, based on applications and, and folks' eligibility in the past. Um, it's not a situation where you can just double the budget and achieve that. It's gonna take creativity. It's gonna take um, inter uh, sectoral partnerships um, and it's gonna take a lot of innovation, particularly on the part of New York's provider community. Um, but it, it's also the right thing to do. Uh, we just have heard time and again from young people and, and thank you to all the young people who have come out today. Um, I, I, uh, I really appreciate you taking your personal time to show up on this line to talk about the importance of this program. Um, we will need you this year, unfortunately. I, I know that we've heard that, that it looks like the program is whole in the budget right now. When we see the preliminary budget, we'll understand what the, the modified thinking is and, and where the administration is at. Um, but we'll be here, we'll be fighting alongside our, our partners, our advocates in council, um, advocacy organizations, provider community, and, and young people once again to say uh, 75,000 is the very bare minimum that we'll accept for this year. Um, we need to get back to where we were um, and, and really excited to just hear all the folks thinking today and using that word universal. I think it, it really is promising for the future. So thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for, for hosting this hearing and thank you for joining Chair Rose, the, the rally beforehand. Um, and I'm expired. My email and, and phone number is in here if, uh, if you have any questions, thanks. Thank you. We will now hear from Danielle Fuller, followed by Lazar Trashan. Ms. Fuller. Time starts now. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the City Council and staff. My name is Danielle Brown Fuller. I am Director of Strong Futures at Forestdale. Forestdale helps children and families navigate their paths from trauma and crisis to stability and growth. We support them in their work to heal from abuse or neglect. Forestdale is pleased that young people in our foster care and other youth programs have benefited from SYEP for many years. We know that they need the structure, the income, and self-confidence they obtain from SYEP. Today, I am here to add my voice, urging you to support baseline funding for SYEP. Youth aging out of foster care consistently face grim odds. 20% will enter into homeless shelters, Within three years, only 22% will earn a high school degree or equivalency. Only 12% will enroll in college or vocational programming. We understand that internships and other work opportunities allow our young people to beat the odds. That is why we became a founding member of the Fair Futures Coalition in 2018. Fair Futures has brought full service supports to young people ages 11 to 21 who have been in foster care. Forestdale helps these youth chart a successful life with life coaching, intensive educational supports, career training, and more. When faced with the loss of SYEP, we designed an ad hoc program-based, project-based summer internship program called STAR, Summer Training Activist Program, where we put 33 young people in project-based learning, where they learned skills like business planning, critical thinking, reasoning, creativity, cross-cultural understanding, et cetera. The program was 100% remote. Although STAR was great, it is not sustainable. SYEP must be baselined. 
Let me tell you about one young person that was in our program. He entered the program when he was 12. He's now 17. He came through because his parents inflicted physical harm to him. And he's gang involved. He's not a talker. Therapy didn't work. But through Fair Futures, through his coach that he received from us, he was able to learn how to use his words and not his fist, as he tells us. He now sees a future for himself. He is now more engaged. We're looking to re-engage him into school. And he is currently part of our mentored internship program. Forrestdale remains committed to providing material assistance and programmatic support so young people can envision hope in a future. We trust that City Council feels the same way and provide baseline funding for SYEP to support young people and their dreams because we cannot let them down. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Mr. Lazar Trishan. Mr. Trishan. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. And thanks to Chair Rose, uh, in particular, for her leadership on this issue. I'm going to um, take the lead of my, my intern, Latoya Beecham, who spoke earlier, and not read my testimony. Um, I think, as with the case with a lot of interns, you know, the adults who work with them learn as much from them as, 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 as they do from us. Um, and uh, uh, you know, that's another thing we haven't really uh, talked about, the way that young people can uh, through SYP and through other programs, getting out into the workplace can really um, have an effect on the rest of us. Um, and I think you're seeing that here today, the powerful voice of young people. And I, wa I wanna circle back just to the comment that the Chair Rose made. You know, all of this is a microcosm. We should have young people testifying before the city at every youth services hearing, at every education hearing. The fact that SYP can be canceled without consulting with young people, that is part of the problem and that is a reflection of the problem. And hearing you say that today and putting young people forward um, and, and, and encouraging them to have a seat at the table is, is really encouraging to me. Um, when uh, you know, I grew up in the city, when I moved back to the city, it was, to re it was to replan SYP about 20 years ago. Then it was a program to get young people off the streets, right? Now we've turned it into a program to, to really give them skills and a job. And I think we need to take right now as an opportunity to go much bigger. The call for universal, the best way for us to do that, you know, every, you know, 85% of SYP students are high school students. We know that high schools aren't teaching young people a lot of the skills they need, not just to succeed in work, but to succeed in college to navigate the paperwork, to speak with adults that aren't your parents or your teacher, to, to handle problems that come with budgeting, financial aid. And like Latoya said, you learn all those skills in a job. We really need to use this as an opportunity to step back, make SYP universal, bring the power of, of the incredible community-based organizations that we've heard from today and connect them into our schools through SYP to really build those linkages that'll benefit young people and schools. We've uh, at Here to Here and at my former uh, uh, job at the Community Services Society, I've put out a couple of reports about what could universal SYP look like if it was school connected, really building off what a young people does 10, does 10 months of the year and really turn into something that can supercharge the New York City economy. This year, more than ever, we need SYP, uh, we need the income to those families, young people, to the chair's point earlier, have been so disconnected. Let's use this summer as a way to re-engage them um, connect them to back to their schools um, through a, a school-based SYP model. Now that is a service option within SYP, we really should expand that. Every young person should be given a paid internship as part of their high school experience. And let's really use this as an opportunity um, to, to, to step back and make the program really what it can be for every young person in the city. Um, really appreciate everyone's commitment um, to get to Universal, to go past, you know, fighting for, for slots. We can't have SYP be subject to the budget dance every year and making it universal is the only way to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now turn to questions from Chair Ross for this panel. Um, I have none, but uh, again, I, I just wanna thank um, the, the providers for, you know, harnessing the energy and, um, and channeling um, the, the, the young people's creativity so that um, they are in the right place and, and they're in the right place to make change. Um, and part of that is due to the direction and support that um, your agencies have given them. And that goes for all of the providers. So thank you. 
Council members, just a reminder, please use the raise hand function on Zoom if you would like to pose a question. Um, there seems to be no questions. So moving on to the next panel, which will consist of Christine James McKenzie of the Jobs First NYC, Tatiana Arguello, Kashi Pony, and Fine Michael stop. Rand Good morning to the distinguished members of the Committee on Youth Services. My name is Christine James McKenzie, and I'm the Associate of Communications, Learning, and Policy at Jobs First NYC. That's a nonprofit intermediary that creates and advances solutions that break down barriers and transform the system, supporting young adults and their communities in the pursuit of economic opportunities. I'd also just take a brief moment to acknowledge the young people who have taken the time to come and testify. Um, your testimony was wonderful to hear. Now, Jobs First NYC is currently in the process of developing a youth adult workforce agenda that examines policy, practice, and systems change recommendations that will improve educational and economic outcomes for young adults across the city. For this process, we have facilitated discussions with practitioners across the five boroughs, many of whom are SYEP programming. While the SYEP remains an important program for work-based learning and early career development, there are several ways it could be administered differently to better support these organizations and the young adults they serve. To this end, I'd like to share the following recommendations. Um, first, that we map in demand skills and partner with employers. Data linking new jobs to current educational offering provisions should be a priority. With a constantly evolving economy, sure to be further impacted by the successes and failures of the vaccine rollout, it is imperative that programs have access to real-time labor market information to help them better match young adults to jobs that are available in summer 2021. The labor market information should include data gathered through employer partnerships and should actively tie to economic development that the city is doing to support a collective economic recovery. Now is not the time for silos intentionally tying SYEP to economic recovery efforts. Um, we believe that, you know, that should be something addressed separately. We also believe um, in order to help market the SYEP to employers, the city should not just be intentional about the potential employer benefits of summer youth employment. It should be intentional about how these benefits are marketed to employers. Um, we also believe that we need to remain flexible about remote SYEP placements. While there have been many public health gains since last summer, most notably the different COVID-19 vaccines, the future of the economy and the timing of any meaningful recovery is still uncertain. Many SYEP young adults may need to be placed remotely. The city should remain flexible about these placements and work closer to support programs as they navigate an uncertain economic climate. Um, we also recommend that um, we ensure that young adults are on ramp to their next opportunity at the end of SYEP. 18 to 24 year old SYEP participants who are out of school and out of work should be offered resources and actively on ramp to education. Time expired. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. We'll now hear from Tatiana Arguello, followed by Kashe Hafoni. Ms. Arguello, please. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair, Councilwoman Rose, and members of the Youth Service Committee. I just want to first thank you uh, to the City Council at large for championing and restoring SYEP last year. My name is Tatiana Arguello, and I am the Director of Workforce Development here at UAU. We are the largest SYAP provider in New York City, traditionally serving over 5,000 young people through SYAP every year. Last year, we were only able to serve 2,200 due to the late decision. And it just feels like yesterday that we were fighting to restore SYAP funding. This program, along with a slew of other program, programming, was abruptly cut due to the city's financial deficit. And instead of accepting defeat, we quickly formed a coalition to push back against these cuts. We took a stand and said firmly, we will not balance the books of our city on the backs of our young people. This coalition included partners like UNH, YES, 
uh, here to here, expanded ed, teens take charge, CBOs across the city, our community leaders, partners, our young people, and our elected officials. A special shout out to our uh, very own councilwoman, Debbie Rose, for her advocacy. As a result, SYEP and other critical youth service programs like Cornerstones, Beacon, Compass, Sonic were all saved and re envisioned alongside DYCD. For months, although we were uncertain about funding, we, were, we centered our campaign about hearing about what the cuts, cuts would mean to our young people and our community. Focus groups were formed and commissioned to think through what programming would look like to address the need and safety of our participants. We presented our ideas in countless forums and fought back. We won because we understood that this is not the time to cut programming. We were not afraid to roll up our sleeves and face all of the challenges that were thrown our way. We have brought to, uh, programming into the 21st century by building young people's work history skills and professional networks in which help to secure meaning, jobs in meaningful ways. We inter interacted with new partners that we've never met. Zoom, Google the Google platform, Vimo and other platforms allowed us to connect with high profile companies who traditionally would not make their way to Staten Island or the Bronx. The lessons we learned are now interweaved into all of our year round programming we offer. Where though we've seen pain, we've also seen resilience. We've seen adaptability, we've seen growth, we've seen connectedness in new ways. Throughout this year, we've seen our young people empowered and advocating for themselves and the world that they wanna live in. In so many ways, our youth and our workforce teams were helping to solve real world issues alongside business owners, distribute PPE, become contact tracers, getting people signed up to vote and to help with the census, helping with food distribution, creating education, advocacy campaigns, and he even helping alongside their family affairs. This serves as a critical reminder that we can and should demand critical time services expired and ongoing support for our young people. We need to continue to expand and envision our services. I will uh, add the rest of my testimony that I wasn't able to share uh, to the city council. Thank, Thank you. you. We will now hear from Kashi Hafoni. Ms. Hafoni. Time starts now. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to say, Chair Rose, thank you so much. I am honored for this opportunity to speak to you and our colleagues about the importance of um, the Summer Youth Employment Program. My name is Cashay Haffany, and I am the coach supervisor at Catholic Guardian Services. We are a foster care hate foster care agency here in New York City. And I cannot tell you how vital the Summer Youth Employment Program is to the success of our young adults who are transitioning into adulthood. You know, in addition to getting Fair Futures on in um, 2020, we all work together, um, our career development specialists, our workforce development team, to really, really, really be assertive um, with getting our youth engaged uh, as rapid as possible for the Summer Youth Employment Program. Um, and in that, we did develop um, new virtual platforms and curriculums to help them be better engaged and be successful. But this, in order for us to all ensure that young adults in New York City are successful when they transition into adulthood and thrive, not just survive, we need to ensure that Summer Youth Employment Program is not just May, remains, but it, it, it expands. All young adults need to be afforded this opportunity to work and gain those entry level skill sets to be successful in the workforce, not just in school, but in the workforce as well. Many of our young adults are young parents and they run their own households. So these opportunities, these are inaugural opportunities that SYEP affords our young adults, it is vital to the, to the success, not just of the young adults and their family, but to our communities um, who we uh, who they pour back into and who we all who we work together to service. So um, yeah, it's an all hands on deck situation as far as I'm concerned when it comes to SYP. So Chair Rose, um, council members, if there is anything that I can do um, to help push this initiative uh, and make sure that SYP stays um, a part of the New York City. Uh, young adult experience, I am more than happy to commit my time and energy. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope you you have to maintain that energy. You have to give me some of it so that uh, that you know we'll be um, undefeatable 
um, with, with, the, with the energy and the commitment that you know I'm hearing from all of you, um, I'm sure that uh, despite the fact that it might be a battle that you know we'll be able to, uh, to be victorious. And, um, and shout out to Tatiana from Shaolin. You know, as always, y'all, everyone's doing a good job. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council members, as a reminder, if you'd like to pose a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. There are no questions. At this point, we have concluded public testimony. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone who would like to testify, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Okay, so Chair Rose, we concluded public testimony for this hearing. I'm turning to you. Okay, well, um, I, again, I wanna thank you all for participating. I wanna thank you for your commitment to our young people. And we know that um, difficult budget decisions will have to be made this spring, but let me be very clear. We will not balance a budget on the backs of vulnerable youth. Let me say it again. We will not balance this budget on the backs of our vulnerable youth. We are being preemptive and we will not allow conversation to start off with youth losing any services. During this crisis that has magnified glaring disparities in our city, it's imperative that we provide a safety net for those young people before they fall even further behind. So we will be fighting every day, just as we fought to save and expand summer programs in the years past. And so um, I, again, I thank you. I look forward to working with you and um, everyone be safe, wear your mask, get your vaccin vaccinations um, because we need you. Um, thank you. And with that, this hearing is concluded at 1.11 p.m. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>